Okay, you're on. All right, good evening. Um, this is uh, the Miller Select Board meeting of July 27th. Um, we are holding this as a Zoom meeting due to the fact that we're still operating under the emergency situation. Um, most of my colleagues are online. I'm on the phone. Uh, this is Jim McCaffrey, board chair. With me is the clerk, uh, Aaron Underhill, and Excuse me. the vice chair. Excuse me, sorry. Teacher sorry. Mm -hmm. you. Thank you. <laughs> You're not as sorry as I am to be flying blind. That's okay. Um, right. And we have the town administrator, Mike Kaczynski, and Karen Beret, our operations manager. So welcome all. Um, the first order of business is some announcements. Okay. Um, we have an announcement relative to the uh, new guidelines we're developing for reopening town hall. Um, I believe, Mr. Kaczynski, you can run down that for us briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I know that uh, our uh, Board of Health Director, Health Director and Chair of the Board of Health is on the line as well, or a member of the Board of Health. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the COVID-19 uh, Municipal Reopening Plan Phase 3 Guidelines. Uh, I did uh, have a chance to email those out to the Board this afternoon. Uh, these are uh, in accordance with the state uh, guidelines that were put out not too long ago uh, in regards to the opening procedures, um, most of which uh, have, have already been put in place and have been communicated to the employees, but this is in a formal document. Um, and I'd be happy to, as well as John McVeigh, our, our health agent, be happy to answer any questions that the board has. It essentially outlines the um, processes for working uh, within the COVID-19 uh, pandemic framework and uh, to provide guidance to the employees and to those visiting um, uh, town buildings as to the protocols um, that are in place to keep us all health, healthy and safe. Um, and these will be formally sent out to the employees tomorrow and we'll post a copy on the town's website. Um, and just wanted the opportunity to, to mention it to the board and answer any questions that the board may have in regards to that document. And I don't know if you want to add anything, John, tonight. No, uh, actually, you said exactly what I would have said. Um, it's just it reiterates these CDC guidelines, uh, particularly for employees and reopening businesses in particular town hall we're clearing off any well-established course so we it's pretty much steady as you go we're being a little bit more formal to make sure employees and townsfolk understand what the rules are we can post this on the website as well um, any comments questions from my colleagues Not okay. for me, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next announcement I'd like to move on to is with respect to uh, a notification we received from our DPW director regarding some requirements we were going to be imposed upon us um, through the DEP. Is Mr. Uh, McKay on the line? or I am. Mr. Yes. McKay. Thank you. Very good. Could you uh, let folks know what the new restrictions are going to be? Yes. So uh, as of tonight, um, this d does not require a vote. Um, so that you've already voted on implementing the mandatory watering ban. And one of the issues on the uh, watering ban, uh, once the rural river level at wells 5 and 6 drop below 13.8 cubic feet, uh, we must shut down uh, Wells 5 and 6, and that's located uh, right on the Charles off of Norfolk Road. Um, we had repaired Well 5. I think you remember over the last couple of months I've been telling you Well 5 was offline for repairs. That's been uh, repaired. 
Uh, well, four, we had an emergency repair that was, had to be made at well four. That's up at South End Pond. I advised the town administrator a couple of weeks ago of the need to take that offline, and we had to start making uh, emergency repairs to that. So with well four offline, um, we needed to leave wells five and six on. And we did request the DEP that we leave at least well uh, five on, and which we, we did that uh, because the river level did drop over the weekend down to 12.4 um, cubic feet. Um, and once that happened, they instituted, they gave us permission to leave well five running, uh, but they instituted a much more severe uh, uh, watering ban. And which being, um, we can only uh, allow people in mills to water two days a week. Uh, our, usual, our usual would be uh, odd even, but with the um, with the drought that's you know going through Massachusetts, they allowed us to uh, allow people to water two days a week. Uh, that will be on Wednesdays and Sundays, uh, and they cannot water between the hours of nine and five. Uh, we, it's already been posted on the DPW website. Um, we're waiting until after tonight's meeting that uh, we'll do a reverse 911 call tomorrow. And we're making up the signs at Adprin as we speak. And, and um, I did put it on the, uh, the uh, Zoom town, sorry, the town Facebook page. And it is on the main page of the town website as well for anyone interested. Um, this is going to be tough. But I think what people have to realize that this is what's going to be in the future. This probably will be um, our first mandatory, you know, coming after once the permit is signed. And that should be signed, I, I would assume, as soon as everybody gets back to work. Um, but again, this is just an update. Um, there's not much we can do about this. We can't um, tell them no. Uh, we're lucky that they allowed us to leave well 5 on during the duration of the repair of well field. Well, the good news is we can leave the well going so we can provide water. The first priority, of course, is drinking water. Um, so uh, <clears throat> these are things that we just have to in, in implement and enforce. So uh, it's just in a very, very dry period again, and it's unfortunate. But any comments from my colleagues? None from me, uh no, thank you. I'm just glad they let us do it. Yeah, me too. Um, just as a personal note, Karen, I have a screen that says you can let me in. Oh, good. Let me see. Well, I don't know if it's good, but let me see if it works. I shall happily let you in. Hold on. I see you. I don't see you, but I see your name. Oh, I see you. <laughs> now, this is my phone number, so I'm afraid to, <laughs> afraid to hang up the phone. But I will. back to the latest videos. Great. Uh, let's see here. Well, I think you could merge the two. There you are, Jim. Can you hear? Can you hear us? I can. Yes. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Great. Question for the technology directors: I should have hang up the phone. Right. I'm not sure where it's coming. Where the, the yeah. sound is coming from? Unless you're certain where it's coming from, leave well enough alone. Oh no! I lost it. Perfect. No, you're here. We hear you. You're it. here. We can see you. We see you because I can't. I can't see you. <laughs> oh dear Lord. Oh well. Let's keep going. And if I can get back, I'll be back. Fair enough. The fun of, of uh, Zoom. So the next item, uh, we have an appointment at six thirty. Um, and I believe it's six thirty. So uh, I think we could ask. The health director and Kathy Lana from Board of Health to talk to us a little bit about um, COVID-19 and Triple E. Um, yes, 
I'd like to start off with COVID-19, if that's okay with uh, Kathy. Again, this Board of Health, Don McVeigh, Director of Board of Health. Um, it's been quite slow, uh, good, in the state of Massachusetts, in particular town of um, Just to run down some state stats that we have, I think there's 108,000 confirmed cases, a uh, little over 8,000 uh, fatalities that's following COVID-19. A lot of testing going on. Um, in particular, Millis, a uh, cumulative confirmed, I think, is about 50. Kathy yeah, can uh, adjust that number. It's eight people and 10 probable uh, antibodies. Um, the state is now included in this test. Uh, currently, phase three. I was, as I was talking to Mike Kuzinski, I don't think I don't see phase four as normal as they say for lack of vaccine. So we're going to keep three for a while and hopefully stay in phase three. Well, you're breaking up a little bit, John. Hello? Sorry, you're breaking up a little. I don't know if it is for anybody else. Yes, better. Yes, yeah, so, phase three, uh, in all these phases online, um, they, we get a better sense as to what is included in phase three. Um, and I think that thus far it's been going quite well, and we keep most of from the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we're we're going to be working uh, quite soon with the schools for the school reopening in regards to COVID planning. Uh, so that's going to be a challenge, but I think this is to be uh, in a good shape. Hopefully, things go well. I mean, we get to be a challenge, but I think it's well. The state, if anyone realized, the state today or the government, you have to level ban and restrictions. So that's online as well regarding you know, online. I think New England states are exempt. In New York, I can recall. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of cases. Depending on uh, positive cases, so I think 100 is a number that they use. They don't allow uh, people to travel in without quarantining and certifying. Um, so, Thus far, uh, the update for COVID, if anyone has any questions, if not, I guess uh, Kathy can discuss it quickly. Uh, I think, uh, so John, I, I just wanted to um, review a couple changes with the, that have happened in COVID follow-up. Um, and first of all, we've had 50 confirmed cases. That means somebody had a nasal swab that was positive, 13 um, probable which means they went and had a blood test and they had the antigens to the, to, to the disease. Um, and initially the state was using two methods for releasing people from isolation. Um, some people were not being tested with a negative nasal swab before they went back to work. And some jobs were requiring that that happen. Um, they now say that that's no longer necessary. So we just wanted to get the word out there for when people have recovered and are leaving isolation, it's no longer required by the state that they go get nasal swabs and they can't go back to work until those are negative. So that's a change in the system. And that was done because they realized that there was uh, no cases of people who tested. Some people can test with the PCR test for up to eight weeks positive, even though they've recovered. So they've finally let go of that, which for those of us doing follow up, we're thrilled. Um, the second thing is in terms of the blood test, it seems to be the blood test is getting more popular. And I just wanted to get the word out there that if you go and get a blood test for exposure to COVID, which means you had it sometime in the past, if you test positive, that will come into the state system and we will be calling you. So um, don't be surprised if we call you. We are required to just um, 
you know, get your story about if you were symptomatic, when you were symptomatic, and document that. The, the message I wanted to get out there to people who are considering a blood test, if you've never, ever had any symptoms, you go get a blood test and it's positive, you will be required to quarantine or isolate is the correct term, and then go get a nasal swab test. So I just wanted people to understand that, that, um, you know, if you get the test, you, we may be calling you and telling you you have to isolate and go get a nasal swab and remain in isolation until the results come back. Um, in terms of school opening, one of the pleas I wanted to make to make this as smooth as we can is I know a lot of us haven't been doing our routine maintenance going to physicians. And so now is the time when, you know, our numbers are low, our positivity rate is low, to if you've been putting off vaccines for kids, we don't want to go through the whole process of starting kids going back to school and have to close down because of measles or pertussis. So, and, and the same is for those of us that are older that kind of haven't been doing our routine maintenance with our physicians. I would just recommend that now's the time to get that done. Um, and in terms of Triple E, we just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, it's There hasn't been an issue to date, but we learned from last year that um, it was an extraordinary year. It usually occurs in clusters of three years, and we won't have um, the answer for that probably for at least another two or three weeks. The peak season uh, tends to be late August and the whole month of September. And I just wanted to remind in case there are any sports events or anything that are planned in September, that if this year ends up being like last year, we may very well be coming back and asking that there are no activities um, in our public lands. Uh, dawn's not usually a problem, but dusk is. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you muted? Oh, Jim? He's still muted. Oh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> I'm kind of a myself. COVID patient. I have allergies. Hello. Hi there, Jim. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Well, I did hear all of that. So any further questions for Kathy? Thank you for the update from the, our friends of the Board of Health. Um, okay, we have a few minutes here before our next appointment with uh, our friends from the Elementary School Building Committee. Uh, so I'm gonna jump ahead and look to uh, perhaps a bid uh, um, that we received for executing the crosswalk signals. Uh, Mr. McKay, I believe you're on the line, and Chief Sapphire, are you available at this point? Yes, sir. Very good. So I will uh, ask, uh, I guess, Mr. McKay, you to start. This is a request for the board to approve a bid for installation of the crosswalk signage that was voted at town meeting in, uh, in June. That is correct, sir. So uh, I would ask that the town administrator be authorized to sign a contract with Enigma. Um, sign it, sign. We did receive three bids, um, and they are the lowest bidder. I can report that Enigma is the, as you drive around Millis, he has the contract for almost all the speed signs and almost any other automated signs with the solar signs with the red blinking lights, all them, uh, he installed them. Uh, he was also told from the very beginning that this has got to be done within the next three weeks. No questions asked. He's got to get the equipment. They've got to be installed before the first day of school. They've got to be all up and operational, whether it takes him no matter how many days to make sure that they're all working properly. And he knows that as part of the bid. Uh, with MIGMA, we do get a three-year uh, warranty on all materials. And he actually is right out of Walpole. If we have any instance of uh, one breaks down or anything like that, he comes out that, that same day. Um, so that's all I have to report. Uh, we, we will start. We're going to try to get one installed, hopefully by Monday, at the 
police station at Crosswalk right there. We're going to do everything we can to get one up and running before the weekend, just to test it out to see if this is the right you know thing for us to move forward with. Very good, uh, Chief of Fire. Is this, can you just comment on the uh, this bid and whether or not the uh, the contract that's being being proposed will satisfy the requirements that you've set forth? Uh, yes, sir. I, I met with uh, Mr. McKay on several occasions, and uh, we reviewed uh, the plan of action. And uh, this company in particular has been in town recently and has installed other signs. Um, they, they're really receptive in terms of uh, usability and uh, the ability. You know, if we have a question, or I know there, there was a couple of pickups with one of the signs. And, and they came right out. So having them local is a fantastic advantage to this particular person. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask whether my colleagues have any questions for either Mr. McKay or the chief before we move to take action on the bid proposal. No, it looks reasonable to me for the amount and everything else. No questions here either. So I believe uh, the town meeting appropriated, uh, I think it was $40,000 for this expenditure. Is that correct, Mr. Kuzinski? That is correct. So this bid, again, the bid uh, that we received is for how much? The bid is 32. It's good. I'm sorry, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, it's $32,874. So we won't need the full amount. Of the appropriation, in the appropriate amount. Okay. Um, so I would then I'm toggling between systems here. I'm sure many of us are. Um, I would ask for a motion with respect to the recommendation for acceptance uh, of uh, Mima for these crosswalk signs. Okay, I'll do that one. I move that we authorize uh, Mike Kaczynski to sign a contract with MIGMA in the amount of $32,874 for the crosswalks. Second. It's been moved and seconded for the board to approve, um, to authorize the town administrator to execute the contract with MIGMA for crosswalks in the amount of $32,874. I will poll the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain, yes. Yes. Ms. Underhill, yes. Uh, so the motion is carried unanimously and uh, go ahead and execute that contract. And as indicated by Mr. McKay, begin installation. Uh, within the next week or so. So that's great news. Thank you all. Uh, the next item on the agenda is this joint meeting with our friends from the elementary school building committee. Um, Mr. Clocko, are you on, by the way? Uh, he should be. Yes, he's here. Uh, I am. Uh, <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. All right. I think most um, of your committee is here. Uh, uh, I'm just looking at the participants, and it does look like we have a, uh, a quorum of the elementary school building committee. Um, mm -hmm. I see we have uh, Charlie Hay, our architect. Um, I don't see Jeff uh, D'Amico, not... Chris Everly from... Uh, compass. Uh, I have not seen them yet, Wayne. All right. Um, nor Julie Allen from Agostini. Um, but um, I think we can still go ahead, and I, I would make some introductory comments. Um, so uh, first of all, let me call the um, meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee to order. Uh, present are uh, Craig Schultz. Um, Rich Nichols, myself, um, I don't see, um, 
at Augustine Denise Gibbons or um, uh, or Diane Germain. Diane is here, but um, Denise is not. All right. Um, I'm here, Wayne. Wayne. Yeah, yeah, Wayne. Diane. Sorry. Yeah. Can I just interrupt for a second, Wayne? Certainly. Um, I just want to uh, just explain a little bit to the public exactly what we're going to be doing now. Oh, yeah, Jeff is. Uh, this is uh, the select board and the elementary school building committee. It relates to some change order that the ESBC is considering. Since the change order exceeds $50,000, if the ESBC adopts the proposed change order and recommends it to this board, then the select board will be required to vote on it uh, as well. So there's a sequence here, the first component of which relates to the ESBC considering um, the change order that has been presented to them um, with the permission of the chair of the ESBC. Um, I would suggest that we allow, during the discussion, select board members will also raise questions if they'd like to hopefully expedite the conversation um, and from the point of view of the public, um, this particular procedure is in place tonight because the project that is being considered is one where time is of the essence. And if the uh, ESBC, if the select board does not approve this tonight after the ESBC takes action, then the project delivery date is in jeopardy, uh, particularly with the delivery date, which is aimed, as I understand it, to allow the school to open on time if that's in fact what's going to happen so if i have it right wayne i think that's really why we are holding this joint meeting i think it's a very it was suggested by the esbc a very efficient way to deal with it and responsive to the timeliness of the of the particular project so with that i'll turn it back to the chair of the elementary school building committee uh thank you jim um uh, you got it right um, what we're considering tonight is a change order um, to install a, a radon mitigation system uh, in the new Clyde Brown School. Um, so we've been talking about this uh, for uh, about a year now. Um, um, if you recall, we did an initial um, radon study where it was detected um, uh, with a, a normal residential type device. We did a more robust study a three-day study where we got some results that um, looked to be uh, marginal uh, in terms of action. And then uh, the, um, the uh, federal protocols are uh, recommended a long-term study. And we did that in the, in the fall and uh, or in the winter, I should say, when the building was closed up. Um, and we got uh, results that were higher than um, were originally detected um, and uh, that is the basis for upon which we have been looking to design uh, a mitigation system uh, below the slab to vent radon uh, safely um, outside the building. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've been working as diligently as we can in order to design this system. Um, we are in a uh, uh, expedited process at this point because, frankly, it has taken us a long time because of COVID-19 to get the design professionals to come out and actually do the initial testing to determine uh, what the system would look like, how many uh, uh, extraction points would be required, which are in this case four, and actually to design the system. And so um, after all of that work was done, um, uh, the uh, uh, GZA, the uh, 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 firm that we hired to do that study uh, gave their specifications to Charlie Hay at Tap Hay, uh, the architect who designed the Clyde Brown School. Uh, they turned that um, uh, specification around in about a week, which was um, uh, a very quick uh, period of time, and um, turned that into a, a specification for Agostini Bacon to provide a bid and that bid came in, a uh, potential change order came in uh, last week, uh, which the elementary school building committee considered at its Tuesday, uh, July 21st meeting. Uh, we had questions about it. 
Uh, some of the costs seem to be um, uh, somewhat high. Um, we didn't understand some of the other uh, uh, components, and we asked Agostini to go back and um, take a look at it with Compass. Um, I see that um, both Julie Allen from Agostini has joined the call, as has Jeff D'Amico. And so um, what we are considering tonight is a revision of the potential change order that was submitted to us uh, last week at our meeting uh, for consideration uh, for this board and ultimately to the select board tonight. So um, uh, I'll stop and ask if there are any questions uh, on anything that I just said. Uh, if not, then I would ask uh, Jeff D'Amico, um, who did the uh, vetting of uh, the, this proposal with uh, uh, Chris Everly to uh, to uh, lead us through uh, their process for evaluating the change rate. Right? Hearing none, I will ask uh, uh, Jeff D'Amico to uh, uh, succinctly describe to us what they've done since the change order was submitted last Tuesday. Sure. So, um, thank you, Wayne. Again, Jeff D'Amico from Compass Project Management, the uh, senior uh, PM owner's rep. Um, so, the, the implement, implementation of the piping needs to go through two stories of the building, which is where some of the complications come into to understand the actual work that's required. Not only do you penetrate the floor to get and collect the radon below the slab. You have to raise it up through the first floor, then transition in the ceiling space to a location where there's a clear spot above to then raise up through the second floor, and then again transition to an appropriate spot where it can exit on the roof. So it's not the, the kind of simple linear um, exterior pipe that you may uh, be familiar with on a residential grade. Uh, this one works with the existing layout and around obstructions that are in place because of the completed building with mechanicals and other systems. And so with that, uh, we had to do a deep dive into the, the dollars and cents to make sure that uh, what we were seeing from the subcontractors was accurate. As Wayne alluded to, there was an initial number uh, submitted last week from all the subs that were collected through Agostini Bacon, um, the total about $171,000. Um, with that time, we've gone through and looked at the detail. We've re refined the numbers. We've looked at uh, what it takes to get the pathway connected. Um, as Wayne alluded to, there are four subsurface uh, penetrations, but there, which lead to four roof penetrations, but it goes through six levels uh, because of the two-story nature of the building while jogging around the existing programs that are there. So um, we've reviewed and vetted the numbers. Um, the most important thing there was schedule. And so I had Agostini Bacon put together a detailed schedule uh, which I believe was included in your meeting packet to understand is it achievable uh, by the time students return at the start of school. And with the exception of a couple of finishes um, that will trickle on with a ceiling replacement and touch up paint, um, their schedule shows that they're able to complete by the end of August. And that's the important thing to consider here because uh, time is of the essence as Jim and Wayne both alluded to. So the revised number that was in your packet, um, inclusive of all the subcontractors there, there's roofing work, there's electrical work, is uh, plumbing slash HVAC work to run these pipes. There's finish work with uh, drywall and studs that need to be replaced in order to conceal these pipes in the location after they've been run, as well as painting and miscellaneous demo um, to touch in all the finishes and restore it back to its original look. And so the revised number that was included in your packet um, totals, put myself right, is uh, 158,591. The smaller numbers we feel comfortable proceeding with as submitted as lump sum numbers. The two larger numbers related to the uh, NB Kenny and Agostini Bacon's work, um, we were going to proceed on a time and materials basis as a not to exceed. So ultimately what we're recommending tonight is a not to exceed number be approved for the totality of this change order. The lower, smaller amounts would be lump sums to those individual subs, but the two biggest items um, would be not to exceed numbers. The benefit of having Agostini on the team is they're actually filling in the role of a lot of the smaller subs so that we're not bringing in multiple additional little subs that we have to coordinate to do little work and then essentially be playing extra time for them to mobilize and get on site. By utilizing Agostini's laborers and carpenters, 
we're able to, to streamline some of the small trades with demo and ceiling work and flooring work and, uh, and removal um, to get that all done more seamlessly. And so with that, Julie is here to, uh, from Agostini and able to answer any questions about the schedule specifics or pricing specifics, as well as myself, uh, Jeff and Chris Everly from Compass uh, are here as well. So Jeff, I would I would like to uh, just uh, back up a little and ask the question for you. Um, the schedule is important. Uh, Julie Allen from Magistini has presented a schedule for the entire project and for each trade. Uh, Compass has reviewed those. What's your comfort level of after having looked at at the Agostini schedule? Yeah, it's tight but achievable. I and mean, when you when you think of where we are now on the, the last week of July, and if we uh, have approval tonight, Julie would then need to notify all our subs to order the miscellaneous materials and to get them all on track, on board, uh, and back to the site in sequential order. So it is three weeks worth of work, and we only have uh, four weeks after this week to get it done. So that gives the week to get the materials ordered and released after tonight and then three weeks to do the work. And so the finished trays of some of that painting and ceiling does trickle into the first week of September. Um, you know, we were trying to be reasonable and balance doing second shift work and weekend work for premium time, understanding that this is a big ask overall uh, for the town in terms of the overall change order. So uh, we tried to balance that. Certainly it could be done more aggressively, but at a higher cost. Uh, and we thought that this was a, a, re, a, re, a reasonable balance of, uh, of delivering uh, time and money uh, to, to implement this system. All right. So now let me let me ask Julie Allen uh, to also comment because this is your schedule, Julie. Um, how realistic is it um, for you to um, to meet it? Um, yeah, I think I would echo basically what Jeff's saying. It, it's doable, but it's tight. I mean, I. I identified um, mainly the pipe, actually the install of the pipe as being the, the driving factor. So I'm already going to say that we're going to work Saturdays to get that done, because if we can't get that pipe in and in the wall, you know, then we can't get things closed up. So and then that drags into the school year. So I already have a few Saturdays worked right into the schedule. Um, and I think it's doable, and I have, I think, an August third start date, so that would really be one week from today. So, you know, obviously, whatever the outcome of this meeting is, I will hit the ground running immediately tomorrow. All right. So, I have two questions for you, Julie. Uh, in looking at uh, the uh, potential change order that you submitted last Tuesday night to the ESBC and the one today. Uh, the reduction in cost is within the Agostini portion of the work. Um, and it looks to me like you've eliminated a, a carpenter. Um, uh, I think the initial proposal were three staff from Agostini and you've reduced it to two. Can you explain uh, how you think that you can achieve it with, uh, with that revision? Yeah, so we have a carpenter foreman in mind who also acts as a super on some of our smaller projects. And so we'd have him, he's uh, like a jack of all trades. So he could do some supervision as well as some carpentry work uh, if he needed to. But he's obviously going to need a second set of hands. Um, and we think a laborer will work fine for him for that purposes. Um, and then we will have um, you know, myself has some project management there and possibly even another project manager that we have in the office um, on site. But we took, we, we thought, you know, based on once I put the schedule together, I literally just counted up the hours um, of our work. And that is basically what that reflects is a carpenter foreman and a laborer for those amount of hours. And you, and you think that with that level of staffing, this is still reasonable? Yes, I do. All right, second question. Um, last uh, week when we spoke about the electrical, uh, we were going to revise the scope uh, to eliminate the need to connect it to the emergency power system. I see that the uh, Griffin um, uh, portion of this cost has not changed. Um, uh, are you expecting a change there, or what's the status? 
Yeah, I am, I am actually expecting a change. Charlie Hay from Tap Hay had sent me some sketches uh, revising the panel instead of bringing it, you know, down two stories to the first floor um, to the panel that was tied into the uh, emergency power. It seems like there are shorter runs that they're proposing now that we all agreed it doesn't really need to be tied into emergency power. Um, so I, that that just needs to get priced up. We didn't uh, have enough time to totally nail that down yet, but um, that'll just bring Griffin's cost down. All right. Um, so um, any questions from anyone on the committee or the uh, select board or anyone else in regard to what we've already covered? Please. So on that one, uh, what we were saying is that we would uh, we would approve the smaller change orders, but if Griffin is going to go down, I don't want to approve that for a number if we're going to get uh, savings from them, which I would anticipate we would if they have to go, if they can go to a, a panel that's closer. Rich, my, my expectation is that uh, if the committee were to agree that we would approve an overall not to exceed price for the entire amount of work, some of which would be uh, done on a contract basis, like the roofing, uh, and uh, others would be done on time and materials. Now, we already know Agostini and NB Kenny would be done TNM, and um, we can either, uh, if we set the upset price in total, we can uh, certainly allow for a change in Griffin, either as TNM, time and materials, or, or to, uh, if they submit a revised fixed price. Okay, yeah, I just want to see if we can get some cost savings out of that. Sure. Yeah, Wayne, that's right. Um, I, I agree with you on the time and on the um, not to exceed price. I think our biggest um, risk is the time, not the cost at this moment. Uh, even if the cost changes by 5000 or $10,000 to lose any time when it roughly gets a tight schedule. And I'm confident with our long history with uh, Agostini that we can uh, – get a fair deal with that with the time and materials or not to exceed and, and work it out as we move. But waiting longer to get a more precise price that may save us five or 10, but in reality, we'll probably do the same by just doing a time uh, and not to exceed price. I would suggest um, proceeding with, with it with the not to exceed. Well, the risk and plan is if we, if we miss the schedule, if we miss the date, then we are in, uh, looking at doing this work when school is in session, and that will certainly increase the cost. So um, any effort to reduce the cost at the front end could work to our disadvantage in, by increasing cost at the back end if it's if it's not attainable. Yeah, once the building's occupied, I think that any savings we get on a slightly revised electrical is going to go out the window if they have to work around uh, an occupied building. I would like to ask the third member of, of our team to uh, give us an opinion as to the uh, feasibility of this particular PCO, and that's Charlie Hay from Tepe. Charlie, you're on, are you not? I am. Uh, what's your thought about uh, the spec, the change with Griffin, and the overall uh, um, uh, ability to get the project completed as, as we've discussed? Uh, I have. I don't really have anything to add. I mean, ultimately, it's up to Agostini Bacon to to run their own schedule. But but we we do feel like we've given a fairly, fairly clear direction and a fairly straight as straightforward an approach as we can manage. So, if uh, Julie feels comfortable with it, then we're comfortable with it. As for the electrical um, um, aspect from Griffin, we did send that over last week. And I think they, you know, they ought to be able to go ahead and turn around a price on that by now, I would hope, or soon. Um, All right. you, you, do raise, you do raise an interesting point here, uh, Charlie, that I'd like to impress upon uh, Julie Allen, is that I would not look favorably to receiving any, any uh, additional scope um, to this proposal for unforeseen conditions. We know what this building looks like. You're intimately aware of it. Um, th this cost should be at the upset price. We should not be looking at something uh, unforeseen uh, at some point in the future because we didn't we didn't anticipate it. Yep, yep, 
That's fine. I agree. Okay. Wayne, I have a question for Julie. Sure. Julie, you haven't really said that Griffin is going to reduce the cost based on this new design that Charlie's provided them. Is that your assumption? Yeah, that's definitely my assumption. Um, okay. it, it's just it's just straightforward, less less wiring, less runs. So um, I would definitely think the place would okay. be reduced. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Then, um, if there are any other uh, questions or discussion, I'd like to have it. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to um, uh, to deal with this potential change order. Well, <coughs> well, any more questions? I would make a motion that hold we on. Uh, hold on, hold, hold on, Rich. Did I hear somebody? I was just starting the motion, but Rich seems to be doing it much more formally than I was. Pete, <laughs> Jermaine, were you trying to ask a question? I was going to, but if we're going, if you're just voting from the ESBC and we have a chance to ask questions um, after your vote, I'm perfectly willing to wait. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Pete. Okay, thank you. My, I'm going to make a couple of observations. You've already made them in part, but I just, and I think the presentation was very well done. But I look at it as an incredibly aggressive schedule. All the milestones are basically on a critical path in this schedule, as I see it. They are. Um, and you're setting it up with a not to exceed cost, which I happen to agree with. My only question is I assume you look at the volume of air that's required to move through the facility, however you're doing it, to ensure that it evacuates to the levels necessary. I just want to make sure we're buying something that we feel confident up front is going to work. Uh, that's an excellent point. And, and so, um, uh, actually, I'd like Jeff D'Amico to speak to that. Jeff, do uh, you want to respond to Pete's question? Um, so the design engineer of the system is actually GZA, which is the geotechnical environmental engineer that was brought on to do um, all the long-term and short-term testing since this issue was first discovered last summer. They went through multiple iterations. Uh, last summer when it was first raised to everyone's attention, they were brought on as the resident expert, did short-term testings that proved that it's needed longer-term testing, went to the long-term testing, and then recently did borehole cuts into the floor and did vacuum tests in the month of June to verify the system would be designed appropriately. So GZA is the design implement engineer feels that they've designed an appropriate system that will convey the air and evacuate the building. TAPE was then handed that design as the implementation tool as the designer of record to then draw the drawings and get it over to the construction team. So. GZA felt that they did the appropriate steps to design a system that can deliver the evacuation required for a large building of this scale. Yeah. May I Could follow Pete? up, please? Uh, Pete, yeah. sorry, um, just to follow up on, on Jeff's comment, um, you know, the system that they're putting in is one that we put in residential, you know, large residential properties, and so it's that would it works fine. We've done it. We've done testing afterwards, um, and what they're doing is a standard practice. I'm not questioning that. I just want to make sure that if subsequent to doing all of this, the tests reveal that, in fact, we need to move a larger volume of whatever they are, whatever, what recourse is there? And I just want to make sure we're not left out there as a result of, oh, yeah, this seemed good, but. Uh, well, I I guess I would respond to that a, a couple of different ways, uh, Pete. The system is, was designed to meet certain uh, uh, requirements, uh, uh, and I believe that they do. Uh, the system was designed based on the two test bores which were done uh, that actually uh, uh, move the air under the slab here. Those two test borings will be two of the four uh, extraction points so we know what the performance of those is. We will be conducting uh, uh, 
uh, air sampling. Um, once the uh, system is in place to verify that it is in fact working as intended. Um, um, obviously, there are no guarantees, but we believe that uh, what GZA has designed is adequate, um, and TAPE has has uh, converted that into buildable plans. And uh, what we now have in front of us is um, uh, the cost uh, and the schedule for uh, affecting those plans. I appreciate that. Please understand, my questions have nothing to do with either the cost or anything else. I just want to make sure that we all feel comfortable that this appears to be an adequate solution to the problem. We, we have not rushed to judgment here. In fact, it has taken an exceedingly long period of time. Um, uh, I agree with you. A level of comfort uh, is what we're all looking for here. Um, a guarantee to predict the future is not something that I'm capable of doing. Uh, I thought you were a lot of things, Wayne, but uh, you've let me down on this one. Well, well, no, you've done a superb job. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> uh, the Oracle has spoken. Uh, any, any other questions? All right, would somebody would like to make a motion? I make a motion that uh, we approve the change order for Augustini Bacon for the total number of, uh, not to exceed of $158,591 for radon remediation work. Uh, Rich, I'd like for you to amend that motion to uh, put it in the context of recommending to the select board to accept um, uh, that amount because it is in fact uh, in excess of our, of our authority. All right, so I make a recommendation for the select board to approve the amount of $158,591 for remediation, for radon remediation work on the Clyde Brown School. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Uh, by roll, um, Diane Germain, how do you vote? Aye. Rich Nichols, how do you vote? Aye. Craig Schultz, how do you vote? Aye. Wayne Clacko votes aye. Motion carries unanimously. Um, with that, um, I will um, ask uh, Mr. McCaffrey whether or not he would like us to adjourn for your deliberation or whether you'd like us to stay on. Um, but we would like the select board to continue to consider our motion, um, if you can, um, uh, immediately. Um, is our, our expectation is that we will consider your recommendation. Now your folks are free to stay on, particularly if we have any further questions, might be a good idea before you adjourn your meeting. And we have another item we'd like to deal with uh, from the point of view of the PBC. So I'd like to have you, Wayne, and maybe Rich hang on uh, to, so we can deal with that as well after this. Will do. Okay, so now I will turn to my colleagues on the select board. We have a recommendation that we've received tonight from the elementary school building committee that we adopt a uh, change order that they recommend for radon mitigation at the Clyde Brown School. Um, questions from the board? I've already asked mine. I'm satis very satisfied. I think this all sounds reasonable to me. Okay, then that being the case, I have no questions, and I do think it was valuable for us all to listen to the same presentation from um, D'Agostini and the other folks. Um, so I would entertain a motion from the select board, and maybe I'll just make the motion, to make the motion that the select board approve the change order recommendation by, made by the ESBC for radon mitigation project in an amount not to exceed $158,591 and to direct the town administrator to execute any contracts necessary to fulfill that obligation. Second. With the point so that moved by the Clyde Brown School. The Clyde Brown School. It's been moved and seconded to approve the change order of the Clyde Brown School project. Again, I will call the select board. Uh, Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain? Yes. Ms. Underhill? Yes. 
Uh, motion and carried unanimously. So the board has approved the request and directs the town administrator to work with um, the contractors and whatnot to get that contract in place. And appreciate the effort by ESBC to come tonight and share with us their deliberations so we can move in a uh, prudent and quick fashion. So that being said, um, you would like to hold on when you and Rich, um, or anybody for that matter, but you may, if you want to adjourn your meeting, go right ahead. All right. Well, I would certainly like to uh, thank the select board for their willingness to consider uh, this issue in this in this way. I appreciate it very much. Um, I just have one other comment before we sign off. It's quite curious to me that Mr. Germain seems to be sitting out in the uh, Great Plains of the West, and his wife seems to be sitting in a basement somewhere, and I'm not sure how that, uh, uh, that all happened to come to pass. But uh, I, I think you've described it very, very well. Oh, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, but with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, uh, adjourn the ESBC meeting, and I would thank all of our uh, design team, Charlie Hay, Jeff D'Amico, Chris Everly, and Julie. You have your marching orders. Um, please get started. So, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. You need a motion? Please do. Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Uh, made, motion has been made and seconded. Diane Germain, how do you vote? Aye. Craig Schultz? Aye. Rich Nichols? Aye. And clock of votes aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we so now? We will start. We're going to move, jump to uh, a uh, agenda item 20 153, uh, respecting the appointment of a member of the permanent building committee. Um, we have had one of the members resign. Uh, one of the long-serving and um, highly praised members. I'll let uh, Mr. Plocko, who chairs the PBC, speak to that issue. And also, I believe he's going to present to us a recommendation to appoint uh, an individual to uh, take on a full-time position on the Permanent Building Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McCaffrey. Um, uh, uh, Pat Sheehan, um, uh, valuable member of the uh, of the permanent building committee for I believe uh, at least 12 years um, uh, has um, uh, been unable to uh, proceed because of personal and uh, work commitments. Um, Pat has been um, an exceptionally valuable member of the committee and to the town. Um, he joined the committee uh, prior to um, the design of the um, of the library. Um, he served on that committee, um, giving us valuable information because of his technical background in um, uh, geotechnical work. Um, uh, if you recall, there is uh, 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 an issue with uh, groundwater contamination in that area. Uh, Pat was invaluable in assisting us uh, as we worked through um, uh, dealing with that. Uh, we had a similar problem when we when we demolished the old library in, in uh, the process of constructing the new, the new police station. We discovered a, um, uh, an old DPW site that had been there and uh, uh, materials that had been um, disposed of uh, 60, 70 years ago. Um, and again, um, not only as a member of the committee, but his uh, expertise in this particular area dealing with soils and contamination, uh, Pat was invaluable to us. And uh, his firm is, has, in fact, been invaluable in the discussion that we just had regarding the ESPC with, in regard to the radon. Uh, um, I am uh, sorry to lose him as a member, um, and um, uh, but at the same time, I understand that he's not he's no longer able to give it the commitment uh, that he did, and so uh, hence uh, the vacancy. But at the same time, I will tell you that we have a very qualified member uh, uh, or candidate that is willing to step up, and that's Rich Nichols, who um, you already know as a member of the elementary school building committee. He 
uh, was not, is not a member of the permanent building committee. That his uh, appointment was just for the Clyde Brown School project. Uh, I'm sure you know him also as the chairman of the planning board. Uh, he brings uh, substantial um, construction expertise in both residential and commercial. Um, and I think you have just uh, heard him uh, ask uh, uh, very pertinent technical questions in regarding to the, this issue regarding radon. So he's very qualified um, and um, uh, we would be uh, well served to have him as a member of the committee. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nichols. Anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I just would like to make sure that, um, you know, I want to help the town with whatever expertise I have. And, and uh, you know, I think that uh, I could be a valuable asset and, uh, you know, help along along the way to, to you know, determine things that we should look at um, in projects. So. Thank you very much. So I would just like to have a comment um, since I've been a member of the uh, or liaison member to the uh, elementary school building committee um, and had the opportunity to attend a number of meetings. Um, I can assure the town and my colleagues and Mr. Nichols is an active participant in that project. Um, as you've seen tonight, asking important technical questions as well as broad based questions as that project has proceeded. Um, it's been a very successful project due almost entirely, I'm sure, to Mr. Nichols' efforts, as well as some of his friends like Mr. Klappo and others. Uh, but in any event, uh, I would wholeheartedly support his uh, appointment to the Permanent Building Committee. Any questions, comments from my colleagues? Um, just a note. So I would take a mo oh, just a note, Chairman McCaffrey. So this would be an appointment to replace Pat Sheehan. Specifically, this, uh, the committee is on a three-year term, and it's staggered. I don't have in front of me what year Pat is expiring for that, um, but that's who he'd be replacing. So we could make the motion that he would be replacing Mr. Sheehan, and therefore he'd serve for the, the balance of that term. Exactly. Yes, I'll make a exactly. motion. Thank you. We recommend Richard D. Nichols to replace Pat Sheehan on the Permanent Building Committee for the term to cover Pat Sheehan's term. I think that's all I need to say. Second. I think we need to actually say a point rather than recommend. It's our point. Okay, I recommend appointing Rich Nichols to the PBC. Second. It's been moved and seconded for the select board to uh, point. appoint Mr. Richard Nichols to serve out the balance of the term of Pat Sheehan on the Permanent Building Committee. I will call the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain? Yes. Ms. Underhill? Yes. Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Clocko and Mr. Nichols. Welcome, Mr. Nichols, to the, to the fray. We now have you to work on the DPW building, the Senior Center Project, as well as um, there's one other. I forget what it is. <laughs> oh, Clay House, Lansing Mills building. So it's not like we don't have things to do. Well, you and by the keep me occupied. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. Moving on to the next item on our agenda. Um, hopefully, Mr. McKay, you are still with us. I am. Good. So we're moving to the uh, pretty close to being on time. The item that we had scheduled for 7:30. This is a request for approval of a low-pressure septic main at 25 Forest Road. Um, Mr. Germain, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, McKay has brought forward some uh, information. Proposal coming from residents of the street as well as others for this this project. So I'll ask Mr. McKay to address the board and let us know the, the parameters here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was approached by uh, Pam Moore of uh, Forest Road, 25 Forest Road, several months ago, uh, requesting that she could tie into um, the town sewer system. And it was, I, I briefly explained to her that, you know, as she 
connected to the sewer if there was somebody uh, adjacent to that sewer system that they would have to uh, leave a stub for that person. And then um, Ms. Mrs. Moore um, told me that her, also her neighbors on each side of her were both interested in connecting to sewer at the same time. Uh, you have a couple of sketches of what is proposed. I still think that this still has to go through some sort of an engineering uh, study um, that they're going to have to have an engineer look at this if approved. Um, and it would be a two-inch force main. And it looks like the way it's drawn that it would be off of the public right-of-way. Uh, this is almost identical to what we approved for Farm Street uh, on the opposite side. I'm sorry, uh, Acorn Street. On Acorn Street tying into um, the Hickory Hill subdivision. It almost identically depicts what we did. The sewer line comes down, or if you're looking at the plan right in front of you, um, all three houses would have their stub and that the uh, three property owners also agreed that they would leave a stub for the uh, adjacent properties across the street. Uh, and that's what you know what you would require um, if, if they're if, if approved. Um, this would be a privately owned system. They would own the system uh, right till it connects into the manhole where it'd be in a low pressure system. The town would have no responsibility. If there's any break or repair um, or blockage, the residents would all have to, uh, you know, pay for the repairs or, or uh, maintenance of that system. It is only uh, five homes, and I know that we're, you know, uh, tied up against the, the cap of what we have. But I think this is what we look for. I mean, this is a good system. Uh, it has been recommended by the uh, Board of Health. We have a letter. Um, you know, uh, approving this this type of system being hooked up. Uh, John McVeigh did send a letter, a recommendation letter for this. So what I would ask is if if approved, and I, I know Mrs. Moore's here, that she can, uh, I think she wants to speak to the board, um, that you would approve, you know, this system to be hooked up, uh, that any, it would, it would be a peer review type system. Uh, any cuts in the street would be done by, you know, DBW standards. And that's all been agreed upon with the residents. Thank you, uh, Mr. McKay. Um, is Ms. Moore on the on the on the call tonight? Yes. To speak. Yeah, thank Please you. Go. Please go ahead. Yes. Good, good evening. Thank you very much for putting me on your agenda. Um, I have been trying to add. We like, the tree, we like the trees back there, by the way. Behind you. It looks very beautiful. Okay. A warm night to be out here, but that's okay. It is. Nice. Um, <laughs> I I've been trying to add on to this house to do a one bedroom apartment, and in doing so, I did not want to change the existing three bedroom home that I have, obviously for real estate reasons. So in doing so, I've tried every way possible to be able to put in a four bedroom septic system. My issue is that um, the Board of Health has recommended that I am not able to because of 183 square feet. It's the size of a closet, but I'm not at 40,000 square feet, which is what is mandated by the state. So with that issue, I'm trying to find another way of being able to use the town line, the septic main line, for um, this project. And my neighbors on either side of me would like to be able to hook into the town as well. And we're all on forest on the same side of the road. Okay. Um, I do also would agree to leave the stubs for the neighbors across the street. Yes, we would. Okay. Yeah. Hello? <laughs> yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, this is Tom Roach, right? Yes, it is. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm, new, I'm new at this. I can't even see anybody. I only one I can see is Karen. But thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so well, you, know, you know, Tom, it says Donna Roach on the yeah, screen. Yeah, that's why I, I wanted to say that. Oh well, that's um, because it's her, it's her computers. I, it's not funny, Donna. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to just talk about that. So so that there's no misunderstanding. Um. 
Mrs. Moore had, a, Pam Moore had a, a, approached the neighbors across the street, and they're really not interested in tying in now. I think one has a brand new system, and for whatever reason. So when I talk, when we talk about leaving stubs, what I propose is to run the sewer down the shoulder on the three people's side of the, uh, what do you call it, the north side maybe, in the, in the gutter of the road. I believe there's enough room in the layout, but the engineer will determine that. Um, to run this line. So when we talk about leaving stubs, I'm talking about leaving stubs for the two houses across the street, but on the opposite side of the road, because they don't want to tie in now. And we'll, we can leave a stub with a shutoff so that if they ever decide to tie in, they'd have to come, you know, they'd have to cross the road to do that. I don't see any reason to be ripping up the road now for people who, who don't want to tie into it. And that's how I've done it on uh, uh, Farm Street. We, we, we put a sewer extension there, too, and we did the same exact thing. So I just wanted to put that in there. Sure. Okay. Um, so I guess that I'd like to ask a couple of questions here. In terms of the proposal, um, obviously we need to have a little discussion among the board members about the, uh, you know, the, the, the struggle we're having right now about uh, capacity. Uh, obviously, this although is a very small project, and um, you know may well be one that we would consider. But we'll have to decide that. Um, but I want to ask specifically about not the construction, but the obligation of the owners, where they may be, uh, of this sewer uh, system to maintain it uh, among themselves, and what are the what is the proposal to have, um, you know, a legally binding agreement or homeowners association or whatever it is to make sure that it's clearly understood that if we give the green light to this, it remains a responsibility of the, uh, the homeowners. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you're addressing me, but I know that in the past, um, I think that we, I know that on Acorn Street, uh, we did have to form an association for eight houses. Uh, it's actually a sub-association to the development across the street. I don't know if you always require an association, so I don't want to say that you do because I don't know that. But right. definitely something the board would have to discuss, I think. Yes. Um, put it on there. So, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I would agree that they, they should... A, uh, have some sort of a, an agreement, a homeowners association, with at least the three homes and with the potential as the two other um, across the street tie in that they would be added to that association. I wonder if I could ask a question. Sure. Why, why wouldn't this just tie on to the town? It's, it's a low pressure system and most of the low pressure systems in, in the town that they're, they're not accepted. Um, we have sewer mains that are low pressure but this type of system it's going to be off hopefully if it's going to be on the public right of way it's going to be through an easement um tom is it going to be off the roadway into the private property is that how this plan was uh i, I my engineer tells me that there's enough space that we can put the two inch line in in the town layout however i don't i don't I, that's not set in stone until we actually engineer it Correct. So I think that's the, you know, we won't know that till we do a little engineering, but he says it looks like we have plenty of room in the layout. So if it's in the layout, does it need an association? I don't know if it's on the, if on top, on, you know, if, if the people have to give an easement, it probably would be an association. That's the way I look at it, but that's right. not my call. Yeah. And that would be a town council, um, Mr. Chairman, we would uh, need town council's guidance on that also. Yes, I, I guess I would also like to make it clear that in the event that this is a, even if this were to be a town project, uh, the sewer system would require the full cost to be covered by betterment fees by the homeowners, as well as hookup fees from the homeowners. So it's not a question of whether the town will pay for it, because the sewer, the sewer regulations and the sewer system require uh, charging abutters for both the construction as well as fees for uh, hookup. Uh, this question is whether or not the town wants to take 
I would call it maintenance responsibility for the small stub uh, as part of the sewer system, which I think the recommendation, or at least the inclination, would be not to want to do that it's because it's another obligation which uh, you know we may not want to undertake. And, and frankly, um, if we do this, it's, it's going to be something that uh, we're going to think about carefully, not only for, from the point of view of how is it maintained, but also from the point of view of how we how it. Uh, relates to our sewer capacity to begin with. So uh, I think from a cost point of view, it really is almost irrelevant for your question if that's the, what it is, because the town's not going to build it and the sewer system's not going to build it. The homeowners are going to build it one way or the other. The only question is who's going to take care of it. Um, so I, I guess at this point, um, we've got a few uh, uh, proposals here, or at least indication of what this is all about. I'd ask the uh, opportunity for my colleagues to ask any questions or make some observations about this um, this proposal mr. chairman mr. Jermaine um, I'm going to get back to the point that you were making in terms of capacity uh, I do have a concern because of what uh, what is it Charles River has done to us for our capacity and our capacity constraints and I also um, point this at Mr. McKay. I don't know with some of the other requests that we have pending, uh, particularly I think there's a lip one that we have to consider in the very near future. And if I'm not mistaken, they tend to take precedence or can take precedence over others. And even if I wanted to say, yes, we want to move ahead, I'm not sure how we do so at this time, and I defer that to you, but it does raise a number of concerns, some of which are largely out of our control. I, I, I agree uh, with the capacity. Uh, as of right now, today, um, on paper, we are at our max, that we can't um, take on any, any new hookups other than what's already on the paper. This is not. Um, five homes, um, as part of the discussion early on with the capacity discussion, whether we put a moratorium on or not, it was decided that, you know, the, the, the select board would not use the word mor moratorium. Um, this is one of those uh, instances that a group of five homes, you know, have, have a plan and they're coming to the, to the board to see if we can accept that capacity. Um, other than paper, we, we, we would have to say no. Um, but with the ideal uh, of, of what's still available from other homes that haven't been uh, hooked up and that have not decided to, you know, use the sewer system, um, until we get final numbers on Toll Brothers and some of the other developments, those numbers could, you know, drastically drop down. Um, so well, that, I'm sorry. Good. No. Okay. I guess. The way I look at it is we could do it contingent upon. In other words, yeah, we like the idea. I certainly do not like the idea of denying the homeowners the opportunity. Unfortunately, there are constraints over which we are, let's say, having our hands somewhat tied at this point. But perhaps we can vote on it to say we approve contingent upon and have to recognize we have some other things to deal with to try to make this happen. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's about the best I can offer at this stage. Uh, okay, Ms. Underhill, you have questions? Um, yes. So I just want to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. So this would be these three neighbors that would be funding a project to add a low pressure sewer line that would tie into the town sewer. Um, and the concern that Mr. Germain's bringing up has to do with the capacity that we're currently at and we currently are not in a place to accept more. Is that what we're saying? Well, it certainly is a ask a question and there's a little bit of an academic well not academic theoretical argument 
that we're reserving capacity for homes already on the drawing board. Oh. Uh, so because we've committed to them uh, to uh, add anybody to the to the mix is potentially taking us over the limit. The dilemma we have um, is from a factual point of view, the amount of um, number of gallons we have to reserve for a home, um, we believe substantially exceeds what will actually be used by the home. Um, but we are kind of trained by both uh, environmental regulations and the restrictions from the Charles River Pollution Control District. If we were to add these five, let's call it eight, there's really eight here in a sense of capacity, I think. Um, and they were to go online tomorrow, we would not have a capacity problem at all because we, got, we still have capacity left. But it doesn't mean it's not a real problem because it is. We, we, we've got a capacity, theoretical capacity issue. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, I'd like to look at this, uh, you know, as existing homeowners who are, you know, essentially caught in a catch-22 that what they want to do, they can't meet court of parents, uh, for a septic system on property. So they're coming up with a solution, uh, which is going to benefit neighbors as well as themselves. Um, so I think there's, you know, I could argue that there's some mitigating circumstances here that would go beyond just, I'd love to have a sewer. Um, now that's, that's like, we don't have a policy yet. We're still trying to struggle with it. Um, but I think that's part of the issue here. And I guess I would like to ask the uh, petitioners, you know, what is the timing here that you're trying to achieve uh, in terms of both the project you'd like to do on your property as well as the sewer? Um, this is Tom Roach again. Can I address the board? Sure, please. So actually, um, and Pam will verify this, she's been trying to put this addition on for over a year. She actually designed a septic uh, system. Uh, it's a lengthy story, so I'll keep it short. So she, the easiest, part, the easiest part of this project, we thought from the beginning, was we, we were going to have her existing system add on a half a line to pick up the one bedroom. So we went to the Board of Health, and the Board of Health said you can't do that because it's new construction. Uh, new construction is defined as adding anything to the system. So then we went and we actually uh, perked and did the soil test out back our house to design a new system. The system was designed and I believe uh, semi-approved, if you will, but then the Board of Health said, well, you're short 180 square feet because you're in zone two uh, of the, uh, on the zoning, you know, the uh, water district. And so they said, you can't do that after she, you know, did all the design and and got it all approved and everything. So and actually, there was another step. She bought the, um, the square footage from her neighbor to allow this, only to find out that he was short existing anyhow. So this is kind of her last ditch effort. And to answer your question, as far as timing, she's well past the time that she wanted to do it. So the, the sort of, I'm sure she's very anxious. And you can add on to that, Pam. Yeah, I think you said is true. I've tried to go. Uh, through Millis and, and everything that I was supposed to do, and all the stuff paid a fortune. Um, for architectural plans I can't use, for septic plans I can't use. Um, it's, been a, it's been a lot of work to try and get a very small one-bedroom apartment and to just leave my existing house with three bedrooms. Hey, just, uh, this is John with the health department. Um, just to uh, clarify something, that it was the applicant's engineer that pointed out, and I think they surveyed the property, that they were short by 183 square feet. Uh, this, that's, that's on record. The applicant's engineer that pointed that out. Uh, property cover. Therefore, uh, it was deemed to be short. So basically what you're saying, again, this applicant and the engineers and whatnot 
working with the applicant have been trying to fully disclose what's going on, trying to comply with the requirements. Um, they're not trying to pull a fast one. Um, so that to me is somewhat mitigating here in the sense that if this solution were to work and it would be something that would benefit, um, you know, not only the owner, but the butters, um, that it's probably something that we ought to consider taking positive action. Um, I guess the reason I'm asking about timing is that if we were to make this somehow contingent, it's got to be contingent on what? Some event, some termination, some specific time. Otherwise, it doesn't really address the homeowner's request uh, to get approval uh, for this project. And, you know, from my point of view, um, I'm willing to consider approving it subject to, you know, submission of actual engineering plans, review by the town's engineer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that we can be sure that this is the project that we all will be comfortable with. Um, but that's not the same question as the capacity question, which is really, you know, what this is all about. And, and frankly, if we didn't have a capacity question to deal with, this would probably be very simple to approve. Um, because it's something that it's not going to cost the town anything. It's going to add capacity. It adds capacity to the sewer system, which means more rate payers, uh, which is beneficial to the system itself. So, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we can craft a contingency which relates to the capacity issue. Mr. Chairman, I mean, may I ask one question? Why don't we think about, okay, we can't, we know we've got a capacity problem. Suppose we say, until that's resolved, we will approve one connection to one of the to the one stub. The other stubs go in, but we have no approval until we resolve our issues with Charles River. But we're willing to basically say, from the town's perspective, given what this resident's trying to do, given what she's been through, we're willing to move forward and say, go ahead, put it in, and you, but you alone at this time, can connect. The stubs will go in, but they're not being permitted to be connected to until we get the problems with Charles River resolved. Um, can I address that, please? Yes. Yes, Mr. Roach. Yeah, the problem with that is that the three people on her true neighbors on her side are all going to be um, pitching in, if you will, for the cost of this. And I don't believe they will do that if they're not allowed to tie in. Um, and for Pam to do it alone, it would just be cost prohibitive. So that's the problem with that. Uh, I appreciate that, but I also look at it a little differently. That We aren't saying it won't happen. We know there are ways that we might be able to work around this. That's why we deferred discussion on this issue, which is complex, for the fall, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, Mr. McCaffrey? Um, this yes. whole issue of capacity was deferred for, for our fall discussions. Um, the problem, as I see it, is we plain and simple don't have the capacity, but I'm willing to suggest that maybe we take a risk and say, okay, we're still going to go over by one with the understanding that one way or another, this capacity issue has to be resolved. It's, the town can't continue in this mode indefinitely, and we have to come up with some way to resolve it this fall. So we're talking until November when we have town meeting and assume they approve our request, that's as long as it would be deferred. I don't know. I can't see any other way around it. Chairman McCaffrey? Yes. I, I, do, I do have a couple other things, if I may. Sure. Um, Please. So first, let me just ask you and Mr. Germain for some clarification. So. In terms of capacity, we have some that are like reserved or earmarked for properties that are being planned to go in. Um, since they're not in, 
we're technically not at capacity right at this time. <clears throat> so we could potentially approve this, but do we have a time frame on how fast the ones that have been earmarked are going to come due or it could possibly become an issue? This is a little more complex. May I answer that, Mr. McCaffrey? Sure, go ahead. Uh, there are approximately 70 some odd homes that have had stubs in front of their property for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. They haven't tied in, but they're still being counted as part of the capacity issue. There are also others that are that have been approved for development to go in and so on. But let's just deal with the 70 some odd. The issue is how do you deal with that? Theoretically, if we could use that capacity elsewhere, we would do so. But that's easier said than done. Once they are there, you can't, uh, there are legal implications that we've been going through with town council and others. So we're looking at other options that we didn't want to get into for the May town meeting, or I guess the June town meeting. Uh, but okay. it's a complicated issue at this point. And I that's understand. Why, that's why I'm saying, yeah, we know there are some that technically haven't tied in that are being counted at about a rate of between 50 and 70 percent of what the real capacity is. Uh, I mean, the real capacity is 50 to 70 percent higher than what they would be. But I'm just trying to come up with a workaround. Yes, there's a risk. But I think it's worth taking some risks for our homeowners, such as Ms. Ms. Moore. I just wanted to circle back to, to one more thing. I don't recall getting an answer, actually. When So it, it, going back to the original uh, proposal, so there'd be um, five total. There'd be two stubs left on one side. There'd be three um, three households hooking up on the other side. Um, the, the, the neighbors would be all funding the project to put the line in. Um, so I don't think we got an answer though about the like maintenance and repairs. Like would there be a homeowners association? Is there some kind of a plan currently? How do we make sure that that uh, part is covered and protected? Well, all I can, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the only way that we, the last Acorn Street was the last um, subdivision of this type that was added in. There was 14 homes across the uh, across from the development, and the part of the planning board decision was to bring over a sewer stub because we knew that the property across the street was going to be uh, developed. As part of that, uh, those 14 hook up those homes being hooked up. They all have to be a member of the uh, homeowners association of the Hickory Hill subdivision. Uh, again, mainly because it is a low, low pressure system that gets pumped up and it gets uh, thrown into a gravity system that eventually goes to a pump station and, and the sewage gets uh, pumped into the Charles River uh, district. Um, you know, five homes, if, if it was a one home, I mean, the, the responsibility of that person would have to maintain it. A low pressure system. Um, let's see, if you want to take an example of the uh, Toll Brothers project, they brought two low pressure systems down the street, one for their project alone, and another three inch uh, low pressure system for uh, all the homeowners on Orchard Street. Um, the system in the street where it's a, it's a large main three inch, the town has taken ownership of that over. The sewer stubs. <coughs> Um, when they say a sewer stub, a sewer stub is from where it connects into the sewer system until it um, ties into the uh, system out in the street. These three homes are going to be off the road. Uh, it was my understanding from the beginning that this was going to be private. It was going to be off into private um, land. Uh, until I see plans, I, I can't, um, you know, comment on that. It, it was proposed that it was going to be off the roadway and, and it was going to be built you know, in, not in, in the town's easement. Um, so it would be my recommendation that, yes, that these five, you know, if, if approved, these five homes would have to um, 
come up with a homeowners association for the maintenance uh, for the system. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to add, uh, in, in terms of the actual uh, uh, action by the board acting as the sewer commissioners, if we were to approve the project, we could certainly put conditions on it. Mm -hmm. Condition with a homeowners association being responsible, for example. We could condition it that uh, we, you know, we could require ins regular inspections or whatever we think is appropriate. We certainly could require an engineering plan that meets the requirements, uh, that meets the uh, review of the town, the GPW, as well as the town's engineer, which I think we would do at a minimum. Um, and it does seem to me, at least with respect to those who are not interested in hooking up today, is we would be within our rights to, um, I mean, the issue of putting the stub in for the houses across the street that don't want to hook up right now is really relates to our sewer regulations that if you run a main down a street, a sewer main, you make it available to all abutters. So if we were to install um, the stubs on the far side of the road uh, for uh, this particular street, I think we're well within our rights to say that those across the street do not have the right to hook up um, by right they have the right to apply, but they don't have the right to hook up. So we could, I think, limit the exposure, at least with respect to those who are actually going to participate and hook up to the system. Now, that still doesn't address the, um, the capacity issue, but it does limit the number of homes that would be part of this while responding to the homeowner who looks to share the cost with her neighbors who apparently are interested in uh, joining the sewer system. So. You know, my view is that we could indicate approval, uh, contingent approval, certainly contingent on certain transactions. I'm not sure that this applicant is, is interested in getting a contingency that would last till November. Um, that may not, I don't know, Ms. Moore, if you'd like to address that. I'm uh, we'll doing the best we can here, but we don't want to, we don't want to violate either requirements to everybody else or the, you, the interest you have in trying to solve a problem on your property. Well, I honestly, I'm not interested in waiting until November to start building. <laughs> That's a long, a long time to wait again. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Roach. Um, I agree with what you just said about the um, the two across the street because you know if you count them in, it could be it could be so that they they don't hook up for another ten years. So there's really no need, I don't feel, to count them in at this point. Because um, there is a considerable expense for them to do that to cross the road. So I, I agree with what you said there. And I just want to address something uh, Jim said. Jim, whether that whether the sewer is in the layout of the of the road or off property in an easement, um, I agree. There still should be a maintenance plan. Um, we just haven't had the chance to engineer it out to see where the line would be. But to, to create association, and this is for you, Pam, too, it's for, for three houses on a two inch line, it's really not going to be a, a lot, Pam. So I just wanted you to know that. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Right. That's is it? So, can I, can I just want to clarify one thing because the picture here uh, that I'm looking at, I want to make sure that we're talking about three lots. On our picture, it's 53, 56, and 57. No, it's proposing to hook up. No, it's twenty three, twenty five, well, and twenty seven. I think you're looking at the assessor's map, Jim. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I have. I'm sorry, the assessor's map. You can you it's, see it on the screen? The the address is out, out in the front in the layout. It's a and it's just, Mrs. Moore's correct. It's it is. It's out. So sorry. Right. 29 and they would have the stubs for 28 and 30. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are 25 and 20. Okay, those are the three homes. Excuse me. That would be that you're asking, you're asking for us to uh, approve a sewer system that would hook up three homes 25, sorry, 23, 25, and 29. Right. Forest Road. Right? Yes. 
So I think if we were to do it, we could certainly restrict it to those three homes. Um, that doesn't mean we don't ask you to, to create a stub for future expansion, but we're not going to give, I don't think we're going to give the rights to abutters who are not involved in this project directly. Yes, anytime you put a, a low pressure main and you want to put stubs and you do not want to cut that line and afterwards, it's no fun. Right, right. Yeah, I'd rather do it and then but that remains under our control as to whether or not to expand it. So, um, okay, any other questions from the board? Or, because we're going to be asked to decide whether or not we want to approve it in principle. I think there's more work to be done. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's going to be subject to um, a review of engineering plans, et cetera, and an operation and maintenance requirement as well as whether it's a homeowners association or joint agreement by the three property owners, I, I don't really care which way it goes, but they're going to need to do something to make sure that they're obligated to maintain this thing. Let me jump in. Hello, hello this is uh, 29 South Road. Hello? Yes, sir. Not be interested in an association at all. If it's okay. the case, I, I'm not interested. Okay. That, that would have been number 29, 27, sorry. Okay, well, we're not, you know, we're not in a position here to dictate to the homeowners exactly how they want to proceed. Correct. We're just telling you, you've got to come to us with adequate protections in mind that you're going to be responsible for building and maintaining the system. I and understand. That's what okay. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other comments from my colleagues on the board? Okay. Well, then we're going to have to make take an action. I can make a motion based upon my approach here, and then we can decide whether or not we're going to go for it. So I would make a motion that the board improve in principle the extension of the sewer system a private um gravity what is it gravity fed or what is the right term here jim you got it gravity gravity low, low pressure, pressure gravity fed. Low low pressure. Pressure. which would uh allow for us to 23 25 and 29 forest road subject to adequate engineering plans sorry I'm not interested if I have to maintain the, the line. I'm not interested in 29 Forest Road. Thank you. Oh, then we won't authorize it for you. Um, okay. Yeah, so then, would it be 23, 25? Forest Road. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, and those are the only two homes that are eligible to hook up. And this is subject to the engineering plans being submitted as well as an operation and maintenance proposal so we know who's going to take care of it and how you're going to do it. So I'll that's the motion. I'll second that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? All right, I'll poll the board uh, for that proposal. I would, uh, Mr. Kemp, yes, Mr. Germain? Yes. Ms. Underhill? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. So, um, Ms. Moore, we're going to continue working with you. Hopefully, this will not be something you'll be doing for the rest of your life. But maybe <laughs> I don't know. So there are contingencies here. We can work with Mr. McKay and to the extent necessary with town council to see if we can wrap this up and uh, realize that um, you, you have a plan that you can go forward with. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda. Um, keeps disappearing here. This would be Kleinfelder. This is the water system risk and resilience assessment proposal. <clears throat> this is also okay. And I don't know if um, Kristen Ryan's following with us tonight from Kleinfelder. Or, or... She is. She is. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. And Mr. McKay is still so, here. Mr. McKay, can you just outline for the board what this proposal is? So this is um, a risk and alliance assessment uh, in the amount I would ask that the uh, select board approve the town administrator to sign a contract with Kleinfelder. Um, person's here to ask, uh, answer any technical questions. 
This was approved at the um, June, June town meeting. I was going to say May, but the June town meeting. Um, it's a, this is a, a mandated um, program from the Mass DEP, and it, the due date is uh, June 30th, uh, 2021. Uh, and if you have any questions, like I said, Kirsten's here to answer. You know what uh, is in the scope of work. I gave you a copy of the entire scope of work of what will be performed and what will be made. Um, Kirsten, you're muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, we have the proposal in front of us, um, which is. A, I want to make sure I understand what it is. This is the proposal for the. Uh, assessment we have two requirements as i see it right assessment yep. and emergency response plan update there's two this parts yeah okay. what does this cover so what this is is um it's basically looking at the physical and cyber security of the water system um you may or may not recall uh, an earlier iteration of this is actually it's actually a federal requirement um, came out post 9 11 uh, in the Bioterrorism Act that required all water systems to, um, they called them the vulnerability assessment back at that time in the early 2000s. So water systems had to complete one of those. Um, it's basically uh, redoing that assessment, but it's adding new components. So they're, uh, you know, now need to look at natural hazards. So the uh, original vulnerability assessment looked at malevolent act. So this really focused more on terrorist acts, but this recognizing, you know, we have a lot of natural hazard, uh, you know, between flooding, hurricanes, and other natural hazards, and also cybersecurity just becoming an increasing problem for water systems. Um, so there's a series of uh, assessments you need to look at a variety of these different threats and sort of all threats versus all the components of your infrastructure not only the physical infrastructure, but also software systems, um, actual operational practices and chemical handling, things like that. So that first part is called the risk and resilience assessment that's due by the end of this fiscal year. And the outcome of that is going to be, you know, a list of actionable items. You know, what are the vulnerabilities and what are the actions you need to take to address them? But uh, task two, which is the actual plan update, is not included in this. Yeah, that's proposal. that. That will be updated after the outcome of the risk and resilience assessment. Okay. That's, and then you have, uh, you have six months further to actually update your emergency response plan. Okay, I just have a sort of broad question. It's not intended to put any fingers on anybody, but. Um, I understand the need to, uh, you know, perhaps financial infrastructure, some, uh, um, technology infrastructure that we may not have looked at, but we've been looking at sort of the in the ground infrastructure of this war system, along with partnering with Kleinfelder for months and by say years. So I'm a little bit. I mean, we've been working yeah. on your stormwater system a lot. We spent a lot of time and effort looking at the water system, certainly with respect to capacity, when we were considering the sale of water to the town of Medway. Yep. I mean, there's... So, what do we already know? I guess my question is, what do we already know that we don't have to do, which makes this a cost-effective effort? I'm not, well, maybe I'm not asking the question. Well, you did identify, you know, through that sale of water excellence study, you know, we know um, that, you know, supply versus demand resiliency, you know, that's definitely something we know. Um, the, I think the asset management grants will be looking at the hydraulic model and updating yeah. that in terms of fire flow and hydraulic um, deficiencies. So it's, that's a different aspect of this. This is, you know, from outside forces acting against your water system, you know, what might those vulnerabilities be? You know, the cybersecurity part is, is this a new piece. 
Let me ask, I ask one last question. Um, I want to know if the water tanks are part of this assessment, given the fact that we have uh, essentially outsourced maintenance and control of the water tanks to a third party. I mean, water tanks definitely have to be looked at in relation to the threats um, from, you know, from the level and acts, uh, cybersecurity through your SCADA system, natural hazards. Yes, those things have to be looked at. And part of that would probably be, you know, who is that third party, what kind of password protection, you know, or security clearance do they have, you know, what kind of procedures do they have, if any, in place looking at their processes, that is part of it, the operations of the system. So that looking at um, that third party would be part of this, yeah. And so we're doing this because we're required to do it by the DEP. It's it's right? actually PA. It's yeah, PA somebody. Okay. Right. And look, it doesn't relate to this, but from my perspective, any assessment of that water tank that is being uh, outsourced to Suez, they should pay for the security assessment, not the town, because they own it. They own the operation. They don't own the equipment. They own the operation, safety, security, etc. That's not really Kleinfelder's issue. But from my point of view, that's part of what they undertook to provide to the town. So, Mr. Germain, you had some questions as well? Yeah, I'd like to understand, with respect to cybersecurity, which is an area I have some knowledge of, what Kleinfelder's expertise is in this area and how it relates to what your concerns are with respect to our systems. Um, anyway, I could go into it in more detail, but I'd like to know what you're... Well, I mean, we, that isn't in our uh, expertise. That's just why we're partnering with a specialty firm to do that part of the uh, assessment. Well, it would seem to me if we're going to look at cybersecurity, that's a town-wide issue, not just the water issue. And I do have a number of concerns there. Um, I'm not personally knowing a lot about it. I'm not interested in having a multitude of firms examining our infrastructure from a perspective of cybersecurity because that's exactly what opens Pandora's box. I also have some pretty good ideas of ways in which we could increase our own cybersecurity without having to go to a series of outside firms, at least in this area. So I am concerned as to what portion of your proposal here deals with that in terms of the $40,000 that you're proposing to charge us, and where is the $40,000 coming from? Well, I can address, you can address the portion there. The, the money comes from the water enterprise. I mean, that's where it's coming from. So the sort is the system of funding. But if you can respond to the question about uh, cybersecurity. I'll start with that. I, I thought there was a grant associated with this also, but never mind. I think the grant was something else. But yeah. This is an unfunded mandate. <laughs> So was your question about, well, you mentioned townwide issue. I mean, the firm that we've discussed the project with is focused on the water system and has expertise in water systems. Um, you know, I, we could discuss whether you wanted to take a look more holistically at the town or I don't know who does your, you know, well, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. We need to do some work in cybersecurity on this town. And water would be a part of it, as would fuel, that would a variety of things in this town. Right. But I am very concerned about having what will end up as a multitude of firms involved with that. So if you factor out the cybersecurity, and we have to look at doing that ourselves, I'm curious what portion of what you're charging us would be for cybersecurity? Um, I believe the cyber firm's quote was around 15000 
Mr. Chairman, if I could just add uh, briefly, the, the SCADA system is, is a separate entity um, that's kept separate. Um, that's under the control right now of um, Woodrow and Curran. They actually oversee the, the maintenance of the, just the maintenance of, of, of the SCADA system. I think this is uh, going to bring a higher level of security into the, um, the system itself. Uh, many times it was always that uh, asked when, when, when I've asked in the past that, you know, that we tie the system in or have oversight by the town. And I was always told that it was, you know, no, that it was to be kept separate. Um, I'd be more than welcome to look at, you know, if there's something that we can do to tie, you know, this, I don't know if we could tie the SCADA system in because it, it um, I don't know how that could, that could work. Um, but Jim, in deference to what you're saying, I prefer not to discuss what I'm talking about online. This mm -hmm. is seriously, and that's not in any way to say you're not correct. There is there's a deeper issue that I prefer to go into in a much more private conversation between you, me, the town manager, and perhaps Mr. McCaffrey if he'd be interested, or Ms. Underhill too, if they're interested. This is not something I think we want to discuss online, but that's my my view of things in this area. Well, let me ask a question. I mean, I, well, before I go there, I mean, I'd like to ask Ms. Underhill if she has questions that she'd like to bring to the to the issue. Uh, yes. Um, I think I just need a uh, clarification. Um, a lot's been said so far. So is this, this is something that we're going, we are or are going to be mandated to do and have in place. So we're going to be mandated to do the assessment by June 30th, 2021, and to have the emergency response plan updated by December, 2021. So if these are things that we're required to do, then is it a matter of um, who we're outsourcing it to be done with? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I mean, I, uh, you know, Kleinfelder was picked because of um, some of the issues that Mr. Uh, McCaffrey brought up earlier with some of the knowledge of, of their knowledge of our water system, the um, their knowledge of our asset management, all the grants that they're overseeing, that the, you know, the, both, you know, this board and other boards have voted on, uh, would we able to use uh, some of that material that that's in the asset management? They'll be able to use us for this in, in, in the next phase. Um, instead of asking for both at one town meeting, um, you know, I will be coming back in November and asking for for the funds for phase two. Um, you know, our back is kind of up against the wall. It's not that, I mean, we were, we were notified about this. Um, you know, I would say if in the time frame of the May town meeting, it would have been much better. We would have been, you know, pretty much done with this. But uh, a year to get all this work done, not that it can't get done, but, um, you know, it, it, it has to be filed by the, the, the date of 2021, June 30th. Thank you. Well, uh, I'd like to make a suggestion here because um, I'm not, personally, I'm not prepared tonight to vote on this issue. I think we've raised a number of questions, one of which is with respect to um, the obligation of Suez in this matter, either to fund it or whatever. The other is essential carve out of the cybersecurity element so that it doesn't um, get in, in the way of some other work we may be doing. Um, so I guess there's a couple of questions here that we'd like to have some thoughts come from Kleinfelder on. We can clarify them if necessary. I'd like to recommend uh, that the board defer decision on this till our meeting on August 17th to see if we can get those questions answered. Um, and then I, I, I understand we have an obligation to do this. I guess that there's some uh, questions here about the, the project definition, the project scope, and who's going to pay for all the elements. So. If my colleagues are okay with that, I'd, I'd like to just defer that final decision till the August meeting, August 17th meeting. Okay. Mr. Chairman, just to update you, we will not know about the, the contract for the uh, RFP 
Um, I don't believe that's not not the everything's not due till August 21st, so we're going to be pushing this off well into September. You're talking about you're talking about the tank, the tank inspection yeah. contract. Yeah, well, you can ask in the RFP whether they'll pay for this. It's, the RFP's already been been sent out. Well, we can ask anyway, and if we don't have no answer, then we have no answer. But I'd like to at least have the question floated to potential bidders. Because that's their responsibility. Okay, uh, but I don't. I'm not willing to move forward with the vote on this tonight. If my colleagues would like to make a motion. I'm more than happy to entertain it. No, I prefer to defer it as you've suggested. And I, I, yeah, we're deferring it for uh, until the next regular meeting, which is the 17th, not forever. <laughs> if we can work these uh, these issues. If my question can't be answered, but Mr. Germain's can be addressed, then we're better off waiting anyway. Okay. So can I just ask what your, what you need from me in order to clarify the cybersecurity portion? You can expect to hear us in writing within the next day or two to make it clear. Okay. That. Good. Is that going to work? Yep. Good. A little more enthusiasm, please. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right, I'd like to move on to the next item. Thank you. Uh, because we have issues relative to Emerson Plates. Um, and uh, I don't know how much time it's going to take, but it take a while. Um, and we're not far off, but we're a little bit off because there's two issues here. One issue is uh, with respect to water and sewer extension permits for Emerson Place, um, which does have an impact on the discussion we had earlier on sewer, at least. And the next issue will be the stormwater uh, and land disturbance conditions of language, which we discussed at our last meeting. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask, um, I guess, well, I'd like to start with on the sewer and water extension permits. We have information from Mr. American. We, all, we have some uh, comments from Mr. Carter. We have some review of those comments and some feedback from Mr. American. Um, I'd like to start with um, the town's engineer, Mr. Carter. If you could just give us, from your perspective, the assessment of the current state of events in terms of the proposal here for uh, the water and sewer um, extension permits. I don't think Mr. Carter can make Yeah, he's not here. Is Mr. Carter on the call? I thought he was coming. I'm confused now. I thought he said he couldn't make it on the 17th, but he could come tonight. Did I miss that? He wrote an email today saying he couldn't make it. He sent the letter indicating that the revised plan was satisfactory, but that he couldn't make the meeting. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't have that letter. Do you have it, Karen? I, have I don't letter. have one. Yes, I have the letter. Uh, hold on. I just had it up a second ago. Oh, bear with me. Sorry. That's this. this is the one I think. Yeah, this is it. Hold on, can you see it? Can you scroll down to the top of it? Yeah. Scroll up. On. Yeah, hold on a minute. There we go. Keep going. Another letter that came today, Karen. That's not the one that came today. No. It's July eighth. Then hold on. Oh. Uh, I've got one here from July 27th. That's the one I'm looking for. Hold on. That was in the packet you sent. This here afternoon. it is. I got it. I got it. Bear with me. That's the one, right? Oh, no, this is the one from you, Dan. That's mine. It was a 215 today you sent it. Yeah, this is the one. Well, this is the one that Dan, this is Dan's response. Yeah, this is this is your response. I can't get into my other email is the problem. I can put it up if you like. Yes, if you have it, please do. Let me stop screen sharing here. Er. Sometimes Zoom is difficult. <laughs> Bear with us. All right, you can screen share, Dan. Can you? 
stop my share. Hold on, I just saw it. Oh, for goodness sakes. Hold on a minute. Trying. You're stopping my share. Is this the 215? Is this something you sent to us at 215? That's what you got from, that was Dan's response to the letter. There you go. Is it allowing you to do it now, Dan? No. Says host disabled participant screen share. I did not. I don't know how to do it. Uh, hold on. I may be able to get into get into my email. Hold on. Pete, you say you have it? Hold on, boo. I'll have it in a second. I just gotta, it's not the easiest thing to get into my email here. Bear with me. Aaron, I, I'll go to my computer. I'll send it to them. I just want to. Hold on a minute. I have it too. It's the one that she just put up on her screen a moment ago. It's the only one I have. Yeah, hold on a minute. Yeah, this, this is just, for... let's just make a comment. In general, this is not helpful. It's not helpful that Mr. Carter decides that he's going to send us something today and then not come to the meeting. We're paying a fee for these people's services, okay? And it's not helpful to the town or to the applicant if our engineer is not responsive. Let's just be clear. Mr. Chairman, I would just point out that, yeah, right. Mr. Yeah. Mr. McCaffrey, Mr. Carter just received these, yeah. the letter today, earlier this morning. Well, then, okay. He was, asked to, come, my statement, he, he was asked to come to a meeting on the 17th, yeah. And he originally stated well yeah. back last that week he that he could come not back. attend that meeting. So okay, he, that's he fine. Didn't respond quickly. Yeah, this isn't yeah, this isn't nice. Mr. Carter's fault. Nice. I will say this is me. Hold on, hold on. It would be nice if the board members could know this, not by the letters being thrown back from the day of the meeting. And if it's a response then to the applicant, then I stand corrected. I don't want to criticize Mr. Carter for that. The applicant did not file a timely response, and frankly, uh, you know, I think that let's see what you have to say. But the, that kind of uh, that you know lack of time, and this is something that I don't particularly uh, I take some concern. With. I don't know what this is. It. I mean, these are things that are going to affect Here people's lives for a long Here period of time. Here it is. All right, bear with me. Is it coming up? You're not sharing your screen anymore. Oh, for God's sake. Hold on. Would you be willing to just email that to us so at least I could read it? Hold on. I'm going to share the screen. All right, let's try this again. Yes, I, you know. Would you like me to give an overview of where we are? There it is. All right, July 27th, here it is. This is the letter. Can you see it now? It's the same letter as the 8th, with just that red sentence added to it. I, I just forwarded it to you, Mr. Chairman, the three board members. what's in red all that's changed yes from the original letter that you got that was in the packet yes all right i will stand corrected in terms of the timing um but that doesn't mean that this process can't be a little bit more streamlined because we saw everything up to this point Correct. When we took the time as members of the board over the weekend and before to review all the information, and it would be helpful from both the applicant's point of view and our engineer's point of view that it's clear to us, you know, before, you know, 
whatever it is, five hours before the meeting. So that being said, I've made my statement. Now, Mr. American, can you please go over for us what it is you're looking for? Because it does appear uh, that you're responsive to the issues raised by GCG. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan American, Legacy Engineering. And I will tell you, this is all my fault. <laughs> Uh, the plan revision was ready today, and I got it in as soon as it was ready. I didn't really have an expectation. Mr. American, Mr. American, I had no doubt that it was all your fault. <laughs> but okay. Um, okay, so we're here about Emerson Place, which we talked about at your last meeting for the stormwater and land disturbance permit. This is a 43 lot subdivision off of Bridge Street and Rolling Meadows Drive. Um, the select board actually entertained this project last April, April 2019, and did take a vote to, in principle, extend sewer to the development, subject to final plans and final review, and that's kind of where we are now. We've submitted a water sewer permit extension request. Um, as you can see, GCG generated two comments about the sewer design. One was to change the way in which we were going to connect to the existing sewer in Ridge Street. Because the project is going to be connected to the sewer in Ridge Street, not the sewer in Rolling Meadow, because of the elevations of the two pipes. The Rolling Meadow pipe is much higher in elevation than the Ridge Street sewer. So we changed that to add a manhole. And the second thing is they requested that we slightly reduce the slope of the sewer main so that we could have uh, higher cover in a couple of areas in the project and we've done that to their satisfaction. So again, we have 43 house lots. This is something that was on your list, um, that list that you were talking about earlier of kind of projects in the queue. This is one of those projects. When we do a project like this, we assume four bedrooms per home. We use the DEP sewer rate of 110 gallons per day per bedroom, which yields 18,920 gallons per day. Now, as I think some of the board members are intimately aware, that's not a real number. That's a number that's on paper. In reality, this project would generate about 9,500 gallons a day on your average day, which is how your agreement with Charles River is written on. Um, the water connection, there's two water systems available. There's one on Rolling Meadow. There's one on Ridge Street. We, at the request of the town during our plan group process, we conducted a fire flow test on both of those systems. And the Rolling Meadow uh, has more flow available, has a slightly better pressure. I uh, attribute that to the fact that um, there are newer and uh, bigger pipes on that side of the project. Uh, versus the older pipes in Ridge Street, so that when we connect, we're basically going to end up connecting the Rolling Meadow water main system to the Ridge Street water main system, and now they're separated because there's a gap in the water line on Ridge Street between those two developments. And when we tie this through, we're going to end up improving flow and pressure on the Ridge Street side of the project. We'll also improve circulation in that whole general area by providing that connection that is now missing. Um, we have, a, as is usual, we have a water main in every proposed road. We have fire hydrants every 500 feet. Uh, the planning board has reviewed that. Their consultant has reviewed that. The DPW has reviewed that, as has the fire department. And that's a, that is a summary of this. Uh, honestly, given that I had just addressed GCG's comments earlier today with a planning revision, I didn't really expect them to be able to, to get anything back to you today. So I just one, and I wasn't even sure, honestly, that we were going to have a discussion about this. So, um, you know, we're prepared to, to uh, if you want to extend this to another meeting, that'd be fine. Um, but we have, you know, at this point, GCG has signed off on the plans that have been submitted. All right, thank you. Uh, of course, we can see the letter, which is largely like the letter that we received that was dated July 8th, but with the issues addressed. So it appears that from the point of view of GCG, uh, the proposal is meets the, uh, the requests that they made in terms of the actual uh, construction of the system infrastructure. Um, so I'd ask at this point if, uh, if Mr. McKay would like to add anything um, other than his 
reasonably fairly fair and robust defense of Mr. Carter, which was well and which was what should have been because of my mistake. Um, I make big mistakes, but hopefully I recognize them and then um, understand that clearly I was mistaken as to what his response to this was. But anyway, uh, Mr. McKay, do you have any comments about um, from your point of view as ter in terms of whether these this uh, revised design now meets the requirements from the point of view of the, the town and the DPW? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking at it for the very first time that you're looking at it. I have not reviewed uh, both, both sets of plans. Um, I did get Mr. Carter's email later, but I just opened it when, when I was looking for it. Um, I would ask that, you know, that we do push it off for another uh, meeting until I get a, a fair chance to talk to Mr. Carter. And I mean, he may not, if he can't make the next meeting, uh, I'd be more comfortable with answering you know the questions that that were brought up by myself and him that you know changed that you know created this letter okay yes but believe me i mean if he has other commitments i understand but if we could get some clarification maybe that's the best way to go and mr american indicated the willingness to defer this to the august 17th meeting um so i'd be inclined to do that um and um, then we can hopefully resolve it quickly and uh, you know move forward um, so unless my colleagues have any objection, I would suggest that we defer final decision on this um, until the August 17th meeting. I'll concur with that. Um, but we can move then to the next item, which maybe we can address, which is the, if you would like, Mr. American, the OMM language recommendation for the stormwater treatment uh, um, permit that we granted conditionally at the last meeting? Yes, Mr. Chairman. There were, um, as a result of the last meeting, at the action of the last meeting, you requested, I think you took a vote to conditions. One of the conditions was that we um, that we yeah, provide a revised O&M plan, which we did do. We submitted an O&M plan last week, dated uh, the 15th of July, which basically added in an existing section on page, I think it was page seven, we talked about the regular maintenance of culverts, pipes, and inlets, um, uh, and outfalls that the association would be responsible for throughout the entire subdivision. We added the stream culverts to that list of things that they would be responsible for inspecting. And on a regular basis and making sure it was kept clear and that was in response to a, a, a concern by uh, an abutter to that project who lives in the vicinity of two of these proposed stream box culverts um we also added the location of culverts to the plan in the onm and also to the inspection form that's attached to the onm document and that onm document will become a part of the final homeowners association document. So it'll be appended to the recorded homeowners association document for this development. Okay. So um, as far as we're concerned, um, the ONM language is reflective of what we were looking for. Um, have we had a chance to take a look at this, Mr. McKay or Mr. Gazinski, to make sure that it covers the points that we think are appropriate? I know I read it in, in and I talked to Melissa several times on this issue. I think she's on the on the uh, on the call, uh, and I agree that they have your requests are met. And I would I would concur with that. So yes, is, Melissa, you're there. We'd I, like to we'd like to give you FaceTime. <laughs> if we could <laughs> sure. um, so um you'd looked at it and you're okay with it i did look at it and jim and i talked about it this morning i think it's consistent with what the town does for um culvert cleaning so it should be you know maintained in a similar fashion to what what you're doing in town actually i think the inspection frequency will actually be more frequent than um what i would anticipate the town would do otherwise so I think it meets what the discussion was about um, in the last meeting. Okay. Questions from my colleagues on the board? Not really. I'm 
I read that section, I looked at all of it, and it does appear to me to be meeting all the concerns that we raised, or were raised, if you will, at our last right. meeting, so I'm very comfortable with it. I agree. Yeah, it's just appear to be receptive and responsive. Um, is there any action that we we're going to take here, or is this just solve the uh, address the contingency and therefore we can move forward? It basically um, satisfies the condition that you voted. Um, I don't. I was not sure whether you had a decision drafted or not, so I did take the liberty of submitting to you a draft decision for you to consider. You know, for the final document that you'll release for the permit of the project. But uh, I included those conditions that you were at the last meeting, and this was basically just addresses that condition. Okay. Yes. So that in the permits, let's see. Uh, so you have the, we have the sewer. Um, main extension application i'm not sure i see no, the decision here that's the uh i sent you a huge i'm sorry mr mccaffrey i sent a an email with a whole bunch of information in it last week and then in the packet itself i only included a little bit of information showing what was changed in the o and m in order um that the board had requested right does that make so sense? So that it, so it was highlighted, you'll see it, it was a highlighted area, it showed what was updated to adhere to what the board had been asking. So you voted, the board voted last time to approve uh, the stormwater and land disturbance permit contingent upon Dan coming back and just showing that the language was included that the board had asked for. So right, there's no vote necessary as long as you believe that that was appropriate. No, I'm trying to look back at it quickly. Well, it may be useful, may I make a suggestion, it may be useful for us to at least acknowledge that this language does in fact appear to meet right. the concern from last time and that we're comfortable with it. Right, I mean, we've taken a vote. I mean, do we right. need anything from the applicant's point of view, assuming we agree to this, are we done or do you need some other vote to move forward? No, I think you're done. You just have to, you know, ultimately you have to issue a written decision. So, so. Right, and that, uh, I'm sure that gets done. I guess that's the, um, do we have enough to have counsel or somebody draft a written decision, or you, so that it can be signed by somebody? I already drafted it for you. He did. You have it. Okay, where is it? I have it. Don't I, Dan? <laughs> And that that was included in the original email that had all of the information that was sent out to you last week. So, like I said, in the packet itself, in order for to keep the packet from being ginormous, I I simply gave you the updated language. And um, Melissa did review that draft decision. She did. She made a couple of tweaks. Yes. I did. Yes. One of the changes that was made um, to the, the conditions that we had originally talked about at the last meeting was to update the wording for the um, for the foundations to the groundwater uh, to be consistent with what was written in the Board of Health and Dan had an, uh, um, updated that language. Um, I looked at that as well as the other conditions in there. Okay, well, I this. The thing I'm looking at is the O&M plan has a place, 23 pages. Yes. Um, lots of things. The O&M plan is not the decision. It's the O&M plan. Right. There's a draft decision with the same date, 715. It's a, a, a word document. Oh, excuse the O&M plan. Yeah, we don't have that. It's, you know, it's not something that you no. need to uh, really address. It's just something that at some point in the next couple of weeks, you know, you'll, you'll obviously need to issue the written decision. So you have it You have it there. Right, and, and I uh, can forward that on to you to take a look at. But that, yeah, you already yeah, proved that piece. Yeah, my past practice certainly has been 
that the board will adopt the decision that has been presented to the board, and then we will sign it. Um, I don't have that decision in front of me. And I know I don't have it, but it's good practice for us to actually see the decision we're going to issue and vote on the specific decision. So, again, I'm not willing to do that tonight. I don't have it. Now, I, I know it's out there somewhere, but I don't have it. Now, I could be wrong again. I've proven myself wrong multiple times this so evening. I, so, Chairman but McCaffrey, I'm, just, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused. I thought that, so you approved the decision last week contingent upon these three items being updated. Well, so I'm now these three too. items have been updated in the O&M. Now you will, if you say that, yes, this is correct, then I will send the decision to you for the board to sign. But you've already approved it. Does that make sense? Maybe maybe I'm getting my steps. We can figure that out after offline. All right. Well, I don't want to just hold things up for technical issues because yeah. Yeah, it has been working for months as well. Well, we'll be back with you on the 17th anyways. <laughs> I'm confused. Pardon me? We'll be back with you on the 17th anyways. So what's the, if I may ask, what, so in this so case, in this case we approved, we approved it, it, deferred it. Deferred it. No, we approved it pending a change in wording. Correct. So if we have already, if we approve something, you know, pending being able to see something else, do we have to do anything else after that? Or are we, just, you know, it sounds like that was it. Or like, do we have yeah, to somehow so. vote to approve the, that we saw that it was done or... I think you just would not sign it. I'm sorry I'm to be interrupting. I, I think you just it's don't, you wouldn't sign off on it unless, you, won't, you wouldn't sign off on this me. final decision, right? Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Go ahead, Mr. McCarthy. I think I'm sorry. what my colleagues is, is do we keep going yeah. around in circles and around and around and around in circles? So far, that seems to be the case. <laughs> but I think that's also quite telling. We did approve it. We looked at the language, so from my perspective, um, I would be willing to take a motion that the, the board accepts the language and directs who's going to sign it, the chair or somebody, or directs that the decision be prepared and signed by the board. Correct. That's the motion. I'll second that motion. It's been moved and seconded that we stop going around and around <laughs> and we just, because we've already done that. All right, I will pull the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain? Yes. I approve the changes, and so it looks good. Ms. Underhill? Yes. Thank you for the clarity of your thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated. You're struggling tonight. <laughs> In the final of the age, it just gets around the corner. Okay, Kyle. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Thank you for your time, and I'm sorry for the, the chaos that I caused today. <laughs> you definitely believe me, Dan. The cause is at the chair, that's for sure. Anyway. I, I think it's me. <laughs> Good night. Good night, can you, Dan. Can you go back to the agenda, Karen, please, so I can find it? Yes. So I'm I, using three. I, I, sorry, I would recommend that next you take Mr. Uh, Weiss, if possible, which would get us back to... Hold on. Bear with me. Can you still, Here we go. So can you still see my screen? The next thing we have is, uh, okay, we can certainly do Mr. Weiss. Would we like to do that since uh, we've already dealt with the other two folks? All right. And Mr. Gus, it'll be end anyway. Let me ask you if you can hear me because I have, I have to use my phone here to grab well my computer. We can hear you. Okay. Are you going to bring something up, Karen? Or yes, I yes, I can bring up your memo if that makes sense to you. Whatever. How is this? <laughs> I just want to bring up the uh, certificate itself, with page 35 of the packet. Okay, scratch this then. Bear with me. Yeah. Back to my. Anyhow, um, Affordable housing for home ownership in Massachusetts is uh, preserved through uh, 
covenants and, and deed writers that are attached uh, to mortgages. And the certificate tonight uh, it says that the, uh, that the sellers and the buyers going forward will limit the appreciation on the property uh, to below market standards. And that's, that, that's the way we allow families who otherwise could not participate in home ownership um, to do so. So the sales process is done in accordance with the state's affordable housing protocols. It's overseen by the Department of Housing uh, and Community Development. Uh, in fact, the Undersecretary of uh, DHCD has already signed the document. Um, Town Council has also uh, reviewed and approved it uh, as, uh, as the form. So I'm asking that uh, um, tonight the, the board uh, approve and um, uh, the chair sign the uh, compliance certificate for six heritage path. So um, what we're asked to do here is really to uh, sign a certificate that the conveyance of this property is in accordance with the deed restrictions for affordable housing, basically. Is that correct? That is correct. So it's not quite a ministerial act, but it is an act that shows compliance. And I, I do think that the background here, of course, is important because when we uh, uh, provide affordable housing in town, we are trying to do it not only for the first purchaser, but for the next one as well and the next one. So there have been situations, not in our town, but in others, where there is um, some uh, conveyance going on that doesn't meet the affordable rules. In this case, it does. In this case, we have a conveyance that's going to meet the rules, and we're just asked to certify that that, that is the case. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. So any um, questions from my colleagues on the board? None for me, thanks. None for me. Okay, then I entertain a motion uh, that we adopt this compliance certificate and direct the board chair to sign it on behalf of the town. So moved. Second. And moved and seconded that we approve the compliance certificate and um, direct the select board chair to sign it on behalf of the town. All those in favor? Uh, I'm sorry, I will call the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain, yes. Mr. Underhill, yes. Motion is carried unanimously, and um, we'll figure out how I'm going to sign this thing uh, sooner rather than later. We'll end of COVID, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm sorry to keep. Okay. But... Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So perhaps we can go to. Um, Would you like to go? The... Sorry, I was going to say Linda Cherizio from Tangerini's is um, here if you'd like to um, do that. Let's go to the appointment of the library want to, director. Want to do that first? Yeah. Hopefully that will be done quickly. Yeah. Mr. Gzinski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will do this very quickly. Um, so uh, I think the board is aware the library director will be taking uh, paternity leave. Um, uh, over the next uh, approximately 12 weeks. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, I have worked in conjunction with her as well as the Library Board of Trustees um, to uh, bring forward a, uh, an acting library director. So this evening, I'm requesting that the board ratify my appointment of an acting library director um, to begin around August 3rd. Uh, for a 12-week term, and I am uh, appointing Rachel Silverman to this position. Uh, Ms. Silverman has held the position of Youth and Family Services Library for, the, for our library for the past eight years, um, and she has uh, a breadth of experience, and uh, we expect her to do an excellent job in that role, and I'm asking for the board's ratification of that appointment this evening. And I believe there's a memo in your packet from the uh, library director in regards to this. Yes. 
Any comments from the board members? We'll take a motion then. I move, sure. I move that we uh, approve the um, town administrator to appoint Rachel Silverman as the acting library director uh, for a 12 week appointment. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the town administrator's appointment of Rachel Silverman as the acting library director uh, during the leave of the uh, director. I'll call the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain, yes. Ms. Underhill, yes. Motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One day alcohol permits for Tangerini's Farm. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, okay. uh, Mrs. Cherizio, uh, owner of Tangerini's Farm, is, is here with us tonight, Linda Cherizio. Um, and she has come to the board looking for a few one-day special alcohol licenses. Um, just a little background on this. Um, I had discussed with Linda prior to this. They were interested in potentially getting an all-alcohol permit for the farm, um, period, but decided to hold off on that due to COVID and not being sure as to what I think was going to be happening in general this year. So, but they still want to move forward. They're doing well. They want to move forward and have a couple of events here and times when they would like to serve alcohol. And so I will let her speak to, uh, speak to that. Um, Linda, you're here. I'm Thank here. you for your importance. <laughs> um, so uh, we, like uh, Karen said, are looking to do a couple single day, single day permits and uh, the intention of this is to be able to uh, hopefully boost our sales a bit and, um, and do some, uh, serve some alcohol during our normal restaurant hours. Um, we would not be, you know, extending our evening time and all of that. Um, the only, as it says in the and whatnot. Um, the only date on here that has a little bit of an extension for the time frame would be August 22nd. Um, we have a, a musician who's interested in doing an evening event from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, all of the events that we're planning would, um, in most cases, just be our typical um like breakfast and lunch table service, which we're doing at the moment in compliance with the Board of Health um, and the state. So um, we wouldn't necessarily any other, you know, events per se. Um, but the addition of um, um, libations would help with sales. I would also like to add, um, Mr. Chair, that Linda is certified in TIPS, um, which means she is able to serve alcohol and is working with her staff to also get them certified. She's also working with her insurance company um, for liability for the farm, for alcohol liability. We have received alcohol liability in the past, um, and uh, our insurance does provide the required coverage. Um, for the liability, I was just working today on getting uh, getting through the underwriters to actually physically have a certificate just for these specific dates um, to provide to you folks. Um, they were not able to get that printed and over to me by the end of the business day today. But as soon as I do have it, I will provide that as well. Thank you very much. Questions from the board? Well, there being none, and uh, I think uh, you know we're eager to work with you to continue to have success. Visit Tangerini's farm, and this seems like a reasonable request. Um, so I would make a motion then that the board approve the one-day special alcohol license. Is this just for beer and wine, by the way? 
Um, we were applying for al all alcohol. However, I didn't know if that would be granted or not. Um, our intention on that was strictly to not to do a full bar type of situation, but to do um, a beer, wine, and like one specialty cocktail type of thing. Um, but that's all or none. Is it? Okay, I just want to make sure we have the mo have the motion correct. The motion that is to grant uh, one day special alcohol license for all alcohol beverage sale to Tangerini Farms for the dates of August first with a rain date of August second, August eighth with a rain date of August ninth, August fifteenth with a rain date of August sixteenth, August twenty first with a rain date of August twenty third. And then Saturday, August 29th, and Sunday, August 30th. Um, the hours will be uh, 9 to 3 for August 1, 8, 15, 29, and 30, and 9 to 7.30 for August 22nd. Uh, and also, no, no, no. <laughs> Two things. Um, looks like it was Saturday, August 22nd instead of 21st. Right. And also, um, it looks like if approved, they were interested in, oh, you said nine, did you say nine to three? Never mind. Okay, so just the 20 We also have 11 to three uh, lunch service, the restaurant, so. Yeah. But this is just for the alcohol. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, eventually I'll get it right, but apparently not. Takes the three of us. I'll second it. Whatever. <laughs> Move it. Second. Vote well, in accordance with the proposal provided by the Tangerini's ownership. Um, I'll hold the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain? Yes. Ms. Underhill? Yes. And the motion is granted and the licenses are granted. And we um, are hoping that this will help you with your objective and hopefully the weather will be lovely each and every day <laughs> not requiring <laughs> thank you very well, good luck thank you thank you thank you linda okay the next item before we go into executive session is conversation about the select board's uh committee liaison appointments um and we have seen, i have received some interest from uh, uh, Ms. Underhill about taking on a couple of these responsibilities. Um, I don't know, Karen, do you have available sort of ones that are open here? Oh, I do. Um, bear with me. What did I do with my board and committees list? Actually, you know what? I don't have them in front of me, Jim. I'm sorry. I, uh, I have a list from our last meeting. Thank you. <laughs> I, have, yeah, I have it as well, but hold, actually, hold on one minute. <clears throat> the first one I show that we didn't vote on was the TV Advisory Committee. So that, but you weren't appointing that at all yet. I understand. Right. I'm just saying. Okay. That's the first one yeah. we didn't yeah. vote on. I'm just going, let me get the bottom of my list here. Yeah. Right. The next one was the drinking water committee yeah which we also have not appointed that is correct um we talked about the is committee and the communications and i think we were discussing website also right um i have here Excuse me. I have here nothing. Here we go. I'm sorry. Here it is. Can you see it on the screen? Yes. So we have um, cemetery committee, CPC, assuming that the current members are willing to continue on. Right. Economic development, ISNC, emergency planning, and master plan. So we decided that um, until we discuss the the scope of these committees, right. we would have an appointment to um, store 
study and drinking water, pending how we will restructure those. Um, we also agreed to defer on IS and communications till we review that. So that leaves us with a master plan implementation. A master plan, right. Would not agree a point, as right. well as the um, cable advisory committee. Right. So if we go quickly, uh, you know, um, Aaron, I think you indicated you might be willing to take on the CPC. Is that right? Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. we're still working on whether or not we'd have some formal liaison with the school committee. Yeah, I did. Um, I did send something out to uh, put the feelers out and get some information, but I have not heard back yet. Okay. Um, so, um, so, and I'm on emergency planning. If that's a vacancy that maybe you'd be willing to serve because you're the. Well, I think we were talking you, about you did appoint him already, um, right? As as kind of the IT liaison as well. Yes. Yeah. So it would be a. Okay. I guess you could jointly. So you uh, can't withdraw. <laughs> so you're already on, Pete, sorry. But, but wait a second. There's something, though, that I would like to comment on. I'm also on this energy committee. Let me explain. We have these three enterprise funds, right. uh, committees, if you will. We have the sewer stud study committee, but the truth is we talked about we need to consider right. the other. So what I'm thinking, and... This is where the first time we could actually talk is that I get off the energy committee okay. and I'll assume responsibility for those three enterprise committees, at least this year, because I'm yeah. pretty well involved in that right now. Yeah. And then I'll also, at least this year, continue with the IS communications. And we were thinking about not just safety, but do we or do we not want to combine it with web right. site, right. which was something else to be considered. I hate to monopolize it this way, so break in. No, no, I mean, I think that um, if we could uh, go ahead and say um, energy is open. Yeah, cemetery. That, that cemetery is open. Um, Aaron's willing to do CPC because okay. that's an important, you know, it has a lot, well, they're all important, but this has projects going forward and we'd like to have input. Drinking water, um, sewer, and the storm water will defer because yeah. we're going to redo yeah. them. LAPC uh, hopefully has already peaked. Um, so we need an emergency planning, but Pete, we decided this is already on board. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think we agreed on that last yeah. meeting. I yeah, think. you did. Okay. So really, tonight it would be, yeah, cemetery, CPC, um, and energy would be the only three for tonight. Be waiting on economic development. Yeah, economic I'm development. I'm sorry, an yeah. EDC, right, economic development committee. Um, well, I'd like to at least cover the... Uh, I don't want to keep deferring. I mean, I'd like members to have the thought process and maybe some of us will defer until we decide we're going to do with other committees. But I'm willing to take on the energy. Sorry, Jim, you're cutting out. Uh, maybe it's my side. I no, Jim, like you are breaking up a little bit, Jim. I think he said he would like okay. to take on the energy yeah. committee. Try one more. Did he just say the energy committee? He did. I'm pretty sure he did. He did. But can you hear us, Jim? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're a little you're a little uh, grumbly, but we can hear you. Yeah, your mic keeps cutting out. <laughs> Could you write things and hold up signs? <laughs> Sorry. Hold up signs. So you agreed to energy committee, Jim? I agreed to energy. All right. That's something. How about economic development? Anyone? At this point, um, 
if I don't have to do the school committee, then I could probably well, do that. That's a good idea. Yeah, let's wait till we hear back from the school committee to determine this one to see if that's uh, something that okay. probably could yeah, pass. I think that's very important. I really would hope she could be on that. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> the school, school committee, committee and the meetings, yeah. <laughs> Well, the cemeteries. <laughs> no, don't, don't put those words in my mouth. You do. Do you want to decide cemetery then? Yeah, I, I don't, don't mind doing don't, that unless somebody yeah, else really wants to. Yeah, cemetery does not meet all of that often. They're they're a good group. They they're you know. They're lively. <laughs> lively. The cemetery <laughs> committee is very lively. But um bum. They only meet on October 31st. Yes, yes. No, no. I know you're dying to get on there. I I would serve on the Energy Committee. Aaron would serve on the Cemetery and the CPC. Um, And the the to be determined will be um, economic committees we reorganize and economic. Right. And we'll wait to hear back from the school committee. Hopefully, I'll get back to this. Okay. So I would make a motion to appoint uh, to McCaffrey to serve as the liaison with the Energy Committee, Aaron Underhill, Cemetery and Community Preservation Committee liaison. Second. I'll take a second. Second. We're moved and seconded. And I'll pull the board. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Tremaine? Yes. Ms. Underhill? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Um, I think that is it, right? Yes. Is there another one? How do we want to proceed on these consolidation of, say, the Enterprise Fund committees? Do you want that on the 17th? I'm hoping that we would have cover that conversation at our August 10th meeting. Oh, August about 10th. strategy. And, again, the, we're going to be holding a meeting from the public's point of view, which is uh, the board members discussing some broad-based strategic goals as well as community organizations. It'll be a meeting that is open to the public, but it will be a conversation among the board members rather than presentations from the public. So that's our intent. And then we will meet again at a regular meeting on August 17th. Yes. So at this point, we do have an executive session that we're going to have to address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let me just get back to the agenda for a second. Uh, yes, I would. Um, uh, ask the board to approve a I think going into executive session, executive session to consider the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real estate, namely a parcel five on Ridge Street. We will have an executive session uh, if it's supported. On the conclusion of that executive session, we will emerge from executive session and adjourn the meeting. So I will poll the board as to going into executive session. Mr. McCaffrey, yes. Mr. Germain, yes. Ms. Underhill, yes. All right, we'll go into executive session and then again we will emerge from executive session to adjourn our open meeting. Thank you all, and hopefully, I will find you at the next Zoom. <laughs> Yes, shortly thereafter. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye now.